stepping stone. Let's see how you can develop this and take this further afterwards. Um, but thank you. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure how many are presenting today. Um, uh, hopefully everyone will present. Um, but let's, let's start off um, with um, Matthias and, and Lija. Um, hi, uh, so hello everyone. My name is Mateus. Uh, can everyone hear me correctly? Is it good? Is it good? Yes, yes. Um, all right, let me share my screen. Um, okay, so I've been looking at different things since the workshop and uh, I'm gonna present four different things real quick. Um, but uh, everything follows a line, so I don't want anyone to get lost. Um, <laughs> so the first thing is the, the part of the workshop that we, we looked at using Psychogans to generate different variations of Barcelona. And just to explain the data set, um, so we used two different training uh, uh, models. One is the, the different uh, satellite images of Barcelona, and I used a different image that we used in the actual workshop, but it's the same city. And then the, the script for the, this um, uh, generated labels for the city. So using colors to, in a way, give to the network some sort of guide to what we're looking for and the patterns that we want to recognize. And here a little timeline, um, more or less the, the, uh, the amount of hours that it took for the, the cycle gangs to start understanding the different patterns and generating this new models for the city. Um, so I'm not gonna show the video right now. Um, well, I can show the video. Let me see if I'm sharing my audio. One second. So I looked at uh, this different versions of the city and I figured out what could be a way to represent this new models of Barcelona in three dimensions. So just show this. So the, the video is a bit dramatic, but it's just to showcase this idea of using these different iterations of Barcelona and getting the same way that we use samples of colors to generate the patterns, using the colors to generate the estimated heights for these new variations. And as you can see here, this corner is what we're looking here with this preliminary topography of the new variation uh, using a, a grasshopper script, right? And with this technique, I can get different variations and different iterations as the computer generates more Barcelona and quickly like showcase them in, in three dimensions. Um, but then I came to the conclusion that this is, even though it's a workflow that allows us to visualize in 3D, the actual GANs, right, is not understanding the sitting 3D, it's just a representation of the image. So again, this, is, this was my favorite epoch, so <laughs> I wanted to showcase. Um, but then I started looking at different ways of um, what, what people have been doing to understand it in 3D. And so I looked at Sofia Crespo and I don't know if you guys know who she is, but she's one of the leading artists right now in AI. And I came across her work by mistake. It was a, a beautiful mistake. Diana directed me to her. Um, and one of the projects that interested me the most is the artificial remnants, which she took a bunch of different 3D models of insects and she generated um, new iterations of 3D geometry based on what the software understood of the existing insects. And then she used AI as well to generate the patterns and the textures onto the, to the models. And then she used GPT-2 to generate the scientific names for this new insect. So in a way, it's a compilation of all of these data and 3D data of existing to generate this new nature in a way. And then this is a um, augmented reality of one of these insects in my living room. And one of these on top of Ligia's head earlier today, she didn't see that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ligia. Uh, <laughs> um, but then 
I I was very curious about that and I started trying to learn the ways of doing that. So for my first test I took, I made this little model of a hut, you know, trying to understand, okay, a basic idea of a structure just to, to test this idea of incorporating the mesh into the neural network. And uh, I was able to run a test sampling uh, from a sphere, exploding this mesh into like a, a point cloud and then morphing this in order for me to understand the, the process and the workflow of working with objects in, um, uh, in Py, uh, PyTorch 3D. And, and then it came, I'm coming to a new part, which is the materiality and more towards the neuroscience, which I'm most interested about. Uh, space and AI. So I'm looking at this piece of art that is also by Sofia Crespo, and she she did this project that she called Trauma Doll, uh, which is a combination of these collages that she started making uh, with some uh, pro health problems that she was having and the medication she was taking, and and then the the AI started generating all of these different posters that basically was she, she describes as an artificial neural illness, but they're all an accumulation of negativity and self-thought and all of these different things. And she even said in an interview that she feels like it became something else. It became its own thing. Um, well, her quote is, I already feel like it's not me anymore. Maybe I'm working with it, but I feel like trauma doll in itself is something independent. It's hard to explain it, but it's as if it, it lives by itself as if it already decided what it wants to be. Sometimes I look at the pieces and I think, what, what is that, right? <laughs> so oh, I was thinking of that. And then basically I started, I had trained a model in StyleGens, which I showed the class uh, generating different versions of wood. So all of these data that you see here are again generated wood textures. And then on top of that training, I input, input a different, um, pieces of this artwork with this different um, iterations of this trauma doll. And then the result was a mix of wood textures and trauma doll, which became in a way a texture for this trauma wood, um, right? And funny enough, if you look at it, all of the words into the, the trauma wood got put in something that looks like zeros and ones, um, which I'm sure it wasn't intentional but it looks like lines and paragraphs of zeros and ones, which I don't know, <laughs> scary. Um, but then to use this material somehow, I started looking at ways that I can take the geometry and I took the hut again, uh, and with a very sketched you know, texture onto the geometry, how to hallucinate this idea of the trauma wood into a 3D geometry as well. Uh, so, in the end, it mimicked somehow the existing test texture onto the geometry with this trauma, creating sort of a, a representation of this feeling uh, that AI hallucinated into the posters into um, a, a spatial quality in a way. Um, that's it for me. Great. I mean, uh, let's actually, I, I'd be worthwhile having me against immediate feedback. I think. Um, uh, we, we, Matthias is here, which is great. Um, and Matthias has been working um, with uh, uh, PyTorch 3D. Um, and uh, so he has some experience of that. I, I've never got no experience at all. But um, um, anyway, comments, feedback? You've done a lot of work, which is thank, thank you. That, that was really, really, uh, really impressive. Just what maybe I could ask one question. I mean, in terms of the neuroscientific side of things, how did that really play out? Or, or was there much of that in that in the end? Uh, in the end, it was, um, I haven't really dove much into it, but it's the idea of starting to use these images. For example, she did the, the entire like trauma doll. Um, it, it's the, the result of that, and even though I don't believe that the AI is truly feeling those things, but in a way it successfully mimics our trauma and our depressive thoughts and is able to portray into a poster. So I'm interested in that side and my plans for this next couple of weeks, I have a meeting in less than a month from now with a 
the head of neuroscience actually in FCA, FCU in Tampa, FM, FMA. Anyway, it's uh, the, the, the med school in Tampa. Um, and to connect this idea of getting real life data, data uh, of neuro or bio, um, biometrics and converting them into spatial qualities. And it was, it was really funny because today's digital futures was a, a lot of presentations about this and I, I went crazy uh, and I'm excited to dive more into it. But this was an initial uh, test on these workflows that involved these different networks, part from what we learned with Daniel and part with, uh, you know, more research on top of that to, to figure out these workflows. Yeah, I think it's great. It's a, there's a lot of work done in just one week and for such a short like uh, workshop because we didn't really have time to really go in depth in everything. Um, but I think what, what's uh, something important that you have to probably understand from here is that mostly everything that it's AI depends on data. So the data that you have, that's the one that matters. Yeah? AI without data is nothing, it's just an algorithm. Yeah? Um, so then the way that you're structuring your data and how you uh, how you play with that, I think that, uh, that will play a huge role in the results that they are going to have. If you look at Barcelona, yeah, those results are super interesting. If you look at 3D conversions, you just have to figure out in a way how do I encode 3D information yeah, for that network. Because for me, it's always, I understand that uh, there is a push for 3D, but the networks themselves, I think they are able to read 3D. It's just that we don't have yet a very uh, well way, way of creating a data set that is 3D and that is homogeneous, yeah? The reason why um, images are so easy to work with is just because an image is homogeneous, yeah? It's, uh, the first pixel is the same uh, first pixels in, in, pixel in all the images, yeah? When you talk about meshes, uh, uh, the first uh, vertices is not the same in all the meshes, yeah? And that's where uh, PyTorch actually comes into play, yeah? And for me, this will be like, you know, um, some, some, something that I'm also doing with my students at uh, FAU, uh, we are looking at this kind of like uh, 3D uh, objects and how you, you use in a way this kind of networks, even pixel to pix or a cycle GAN or a style GAN. And instead of asking the network to look at an image, you are looking at an image that describes a 3D, for example, yeah? And describes a 3D meaning like, you know, uh, X, Y, Z representing a, Vertices, vertices, yeah. So like that, it's you can really speculate and really play with that. For example, there is a research paper, and I'll have to share this paper because I'm keep repeating this paper all the time. But there is this kind of idea: Are the machines actually seeing uh, numbers, or, or uh, they, do they see numbers the way that we see numbers, or they see something else? Yeah. And this is only because there, there was a, a machine that was uh, predicting was looking at an image that was noisy and it was saying that that's a one and the same machine was looking at the image that was looking like a one and was saying that that's a one yeah and then the, the entire discussion was is, is the machine actually wrong or we as humans we cannot see the number one in that pixelated image yeah and in the end the idea is that the, uh, the machine is not really looking at the image the way we look at it yeah like visually understanding something it's mostly the relations between pixels yeah, that are understood so based on that premise, then for me, it's easy to draw and to say, you know, to draw the conclusion and say, okay, it's enough to input, input that any kind of pattern that has a certain relation and has a certain structure and the machine should be able to understand that, yeah? Without me visually being able to understand it, yeah? So I can convert that any kind of geometry into a sort of image. And if I show that to a, to a network, for example, or at least this kind of networks that are image-based, they should be able to predict correctly things, yeah? So probably that's something that you can play with. If you are interested in more, mostly in mapping, then probably it will be interesting to, to extract the mapping uh, information of the image, of the object, sorry, and then somehow play with that information, yeah? Because right now the mapping that you have, it's kind of, you know, almost like a collage, you just, you just apply something on an object. So probably it will be interesting to, to say, okay, I'm aware of the, of the UV space of the mesh of the geometry, and I'm using that information somehow to train an, an AI and then bring that information in back, you know. So I think those kind of plays uh, will be super interesting, yeah. So you can create super interesting things without even going into, you know, the architecture of the network just by, you know, being smart about the way that you are playing with the data set, yeah. Okay. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, Matthias, do you want, did you want to chip in there? I mean, you've had experience of working with PyTorch 3D on an actual project. <clears throat> yeah, sorry. So actually, Daniel pointed out an important aspect of that, which is, um, you know, an image it consists of pixels and the model has faces, points and lines, and you have to figure out how, I mean, on the one side, the difficulty is in labeling something like that, um, like specify what's a wall, what's a ceiling and so on, so to understand semantically what that object actually is, it's looking at, or what we did was we just ignored that and just created a database from scratch that was um, was labeled as houses. So just trying to figure, you know, tr trying to to capture, you know, the, the, that information in a model is possible. It's a it's a it's a longer story. I don't want to bore you with that, but basically it's about what Daniel really pointed out already, uh, which is you have to create your databases first before you're actually able to generate anything with PyTorch 3D that makes sense and you have to train it accordingly. So there's like all the steps that you go in between to get it there. We're still working on that database. Uh, we've been working on that since I think late April, early May, something like that. And we don't have enough models to really train it properly. So it's just a matter of, you know, getting the, the training done. But I actually applaud uh, the students for, and Mateos for working uh, with that and successfully running already like a couple of examples with that. I think that's super exciting. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Also, uh, thanks for the shout out to Sofia Crespo. I think she's an awesome artist. Uh, just as a side note, her 3D models of, uh, of these kind of weird insects, she basically models those in 3D first, quite conventional, and then runs a 2D to 3D style transfer on top of them to deform them. Yeah, uh, that, thank you. That's, I, I guess that, is that's kind of a bit like what, um, uh, Guven Chosel has been doing it at, at UCLA, a kind of, that, it's not really 3D, but it's kind of mapping onto a 3D form. I just wanted to say one other thing, just in terms of neuroscience, and I've just had a conversation with Anil Seth online, and um, uh, I'm hoping he's going to come in to join the, the neuroscience session on Sunday of next week, so it's eight days time. Uh, and one of the comments I was I was saying to him was that the, the problem, because I don't know if you've, you've seen his TED talk where he uses Deep Dream to... Um, to, to try and model what predictive perception is. And he kind of, you know, he talks about um, perception as being a form of controlled hallucination. Now, the problem about deep dream is it's not controlled. <clears throat> and I was saying, well, what about using a GAN? Because then you've got a kind of discriminator and you've got to, you, know, you can actually can control it in some way. And it was kind of like a naive question because you've got to be very careful with neuroscientists. But, but he said, absolutely. That's, they're, they're kind of working on something similar at the moment with a, with a discrimination and a generator. So it's kind of interesting how, how GANs or, or something similar to GANs begins to feed into kind of understandings of neuroscience, which I think is, is absolutely amazing. And I, you know, I, I go back to this kind of thing I was trying to raise the other day that in the end, neuroscientists and AI people are often looking at the same thing. And they, it's kind of this overlap of kind of they're looking for just simply intelligence and trying to use computational models to understand how, how the mind works. And it's, it's pr producing some astonishing um, comments and things, astonishing results. I, I don't so know. I, just a few other comments here regarding the GANs and um, um, Mateo's uh, project. Um, so um, I think you also have to, or we have to be very careful to understand exactly what the networks are doing. And this is very similar to what Neil is saying, you know, how, how you control that hallucination. Yeah. So then it's really a matter of really understanding, okay, I, I showed you like uh, four, three types of networks, which are, okay, right now, let's say they are just almost like a milestone in, uh, in the GAN family. There are multiple others in between, so yeah, for sure. Uh, but um, it's just important to understand what each one is doing and what kind of task you can apply each one for, yeah? And then how I can combine maybe certain ones, yeah? Uh, and um, just a second, sorry. I don't know whether, whether Wanyu wants to kind of say anything. Well, you're, you're, you're here, Wanyu. It's great to have somebody with such experience watching this. Or indeed, anybody else while we're, we're um, just waiting for Daniel to come back? 
my apologies for that. Okay, okay I'm back. Um, so what I was saying is like, we have to really be careful like the, uh, the types of network that, that we are working with and what kind of tasks we can apply them to. Um, for me personally, I find Cyclegan to be the most uh, innovative when it comes to creativity. Like it's, I think uh, Cyclegan is able to create something that resembles a more cre uh, creative uh, process than than a style again, for example, or big space, yeah. A style again, for example, is just uh, learning uh, to interpolate, let's say, yeah. Like you give a bunch of samples, examples, yeah, and then it's able to learn the representation of those samples, yeah. A cycle again, it's able to go outside of whatever you are giving, yeah. It's able to generate things that are outside of that, yeah. So I think uh, we have to understand that, you know, each one, what kind of task can be applied for, yeah. And then the picks to picks, how I can control maybe even more certain things, you know. So um, I, I think from, from that perspective, yeah, it's very important then for us to understand and see, okay, for this specific task, I'm going to apply this, for this one, this, uh, this kind of network and so on. Okay, let's, let's move on. Um, if there's any, any further comments from anyone? Um, uh, so, uh, Lija, do you want, you'd like to present? Hello. Uh, yeah, I can present next. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, that's very hard to uh, follow up. <laughs> I'm going to try to do my best. Um, Okay, so um, after the last week's workshop, uh, I have been focusing a lot on, on truly trying to understand exactly those differences. Like Daniel just mentioned, um, I was fascinated by style GANs because of the beautiful results it produced, but I didn't feel uh, that it was very controlled and that I could create uh, many new things. So I started uh, recently to try to really understand how I could use um, Psychogan to create some of the videos like uh, you guys shared last week, um, and I'm still working on that. But um, first, um, the first attempt I had was at um, following step by step what Daniel showed us uh, with the Barcelona uh, satellite to labels and understanding the new kind of results that it was creating and how um, the machine was learning from the, that input. And my next step today was um, looking now at if I have pictures moving a blanket or changing the texture, how that can change uh, landscape. And that's something I want to uh, keep doing moving forward. I'm actually still training the PsychoGans model because uh, I loaded about a, a a thousand photos, it was a thousand frames, so it's still uh, loading uh, as of right now. But uh, I also did a couple of experiments with StyleGAN. So the first one was uh, what Daniel showed us in a uh, lecture, and it was using the satellite images of mountains. And then moving forward, I tried um, images of paintings. And uh, finally, I tried different satellite areas in the world, such as uh, San Francisco um, Bay South Ponds. And um, I have a, a video to showcase um, the results of these um, style GANs. So, mm -hmm.
right? I think he also did a lot of uh, great work. I mean, for just one week, it's uh, it's uh, a lot of uh, work there. Um, I'll just have a few comments, uh, like uh, uh, the uh, improvements or how you can look in a way at this kind of networks and uh, probably improve even more the results. Um, so first will be the cycle again example that you showed with the blanket and with the landscape. So you have to also have to, uh, uh, you have to understand a bit this idea of uh, um, what kind of information I have to show to the network and what kind of output I might get. Yeah, for example, if I have a data set with a city, um, a city set, a satellite image of a city, and I have a blanket image. Yeah, so. Uh, the expectation will be that somehow the network is going to uh, to understand the composition of the blanket and then impose that kind of uh, composition on a city or something. Yeah. Um, so in that in that sense, then you know that conversion or that translation that I'm trying to apply, it's actually more interesting because I, I might end up with you know interesting configurations of a city or something, or I can say that I can control the composition, you know, while still retaining the way those kind of local rules that you have in a city. Um, if you just apply it like blanket with the landscape, mostly you are just performing a sort of almost like stylistic in a way, uh, translation where you're just copying, you know, the style of the blanket and transpose it in a way on the, on the landscape, yeah. So in that sense, in a way, try, try to, to look at it from that kind of perspective, yeah, like, where exactly, um, which is the, the highest potential uh, that this network can provide for me. Uh, like if I'm using it to copy in a way or transfer composition, probably it's more interesting than just a mere uh, texture. And then uh, I would suggest also with the uh, uh, StyleGAN videos, I think they're all super cool and very beautiful, all of them. Um, but for you in a way to, to be able to get, to control uh, better the results, would be good for you to always have the video and then what kind of parameters yeah, you used and try in a way to understand you know, that relation between the, the output and uh, what what parameters you are using. And I'm talking here about truncation or other kind of you know uh, parameters that we have there. Uh, because in that way, then you can really, in a way, almost like um, choreograph, let's say, the, the, the movie and uh, try to play with it that way. And then also uh, don't, don't shy, shy away from um, from connecting some of the networks. So for example, um, you have the style again generating something and then you have the cycle again maybe interpreting that thing and translating, you know, and then th that result maybe goes into a style, a style again, again, you know. So those kind of things could be also very, very interesting. And uh, it's almost like to say that it's not anymore the, you know, the data set, because usually we are saying, you know, that uh, AI is just learning whatever we are giving. And if we give a lot of images of a building, then the AI is just generating those kind of buildings, yeah? But maybe this will be almost like the third, fourth, fifth generation, almost like, you know, like where you have an AI first generation, we, I'm just learning from, from the data set that you input with real images of buildings. Then the second generation will be, I'm basing my learning on the previous uh, uh, network. And then the third one, you know, something like that. And then suddenly you might end up with a with a uh, with a, a kind of result where you actually say that actually the AI learned its or it has its own let's say uh, history and its own uh, experience and based on that in a way it's trying to to generate something else. because otherwise it's always going to be bounded to uh, to the to the data set that you input yeah it's, if you input like biased data and bias here can be can represent everything yeah like from aesthetical preference or something else, it's just going to output those kind of aesthetical preferences, but it's going to have a hard time to uh, to um, to output something completely outside of, of those uh, biases, let's say, yeah. So I think one way to, to uh, go about it is just to, to try to chain them or create almost like experiences, yeah. So it's almost like right now we are, almost like we as humans we have our first experience we design and then we output so the same thing happens with the network right now it has the first experience let's say with uh, with the set of the images and it's just giving an output but in our case we have multiple of this kind of uh, experiences yeah we we go through this kind of cycles of you know uh, designing and understanding design and then designing again and so on yeah and probably that, that will be something that leads to something super 
creative, I would say. Okay. Thank you so much for the feedback. Just one question: What what what, do you, what would be the next step? What are you envisaging as the next step for this? Uh, I think uh, taking consideration what Daniel said, you know, um, moving forward with the cycle again would be, um, you know, uh, perhaps selecting a, a better data set and and really developing that, and then as far as the style again really uh, running uh, variations with different truncations and different uh, settings and registering which settings I'm doing for each thing that I'm running. So I have that kind of database for myself moving forward. Uh, you know, if I'm doing a specific video, uh, specific variation, which settings are the best for each scenario. So um, definitely really appreciate uh, the comments and uh, look forward to move forward this okay great um any, any further comments thank you um uh nico do you, do you, i'm just i said you take would, would you would you, what, would you like to go next difficult to follow on from both of those but uh, i'm sure you can manage uh yes uh, i could go next um yeah, let me share I think while Nico is sharing, I think we have to we have to think of these tools uh, and also AI, not necessarily as just one algorithm. Because yeah, AI is not necessarily just one algorithm. Probably a series of algorithms will create something that we we are really going to consider, uh, you know, creative or super interesting. You know, so um, we we should in a way when when we when we work with this, probably we should. Um, stray away from this idea that I'm just going to have one algorithm and then that algorithm is creating for me architecture or something. You know? I, I don't think it's the case. I apologize. Needed a quiet moment. <laughs> for a moment. Yes, uh, I'm sorry about that. Yes, so. Uh, um, I've been trying to develop a little bit more uh, on the process rather than trying to to um, maybe try to make something uh, or just try to combine things. So I guess I'll explain a little bit on the process as well and then show the type of results that I'm getting from it. So to go over what, I, what I'm exactly trying to achieve is that I'm trying to initially start with uh, the analysis of these sketches developed by Tom Main. And, um, I'm very interested in these captures, especially in how they drive his conceptual process in terms of how he creates these uh, abstract sketches and then starts to rationalize them into architectural schemes to then develop his actual buildings in uh, the pursuit of trying to create a uh, non-referential architecture that, that finds itself to be more original in its own uh, plane of existence. So, uh, but I wanted to achieve this in a way that I can develop uh, using the GANs to, to augment basic gestural sketches. So I looked also in uh, sketches by, um, you know, uh, Starkitex too. These are the gestural sketches of Zaha Hadid and also uh, Wolf Pricks, uh, a few of them. And so in their case, they start with these more simplistic gestures rather than these complicated abstract sketches to then um, dictate the design of the building itself. So my intent with the original um, uh, set was to try to create, to get that initial sketch of intent where it's a more simplistic um, sketch and tries to inform a certain scheme and then augment the sketch with a series of the Tom Main uh, uh, paintings as the, the data set and then move on forward from there to where you would be able to take those that output and have a, an analysis on top of it for architectural rationalization to further develop the concept. So uh, what came out of that is that I eventually ran those for uh, up to 5,000 epochs. These are the sequence of initiation. First one was 200, then 400, then I made a jump to 5,000. Um, the issue I eventually found with this was that certain types of paintings were identified with certain schemes, because this initial one had a very low data set, but it started to produce results um, like this, where it was identifying the main shape and the gestures. Um, but I think I, I needed to develop further on uh, the, the data set. Uh, this one is actually, um, so I eventually after that, I want to go to the style GANs. So this was like the series of the face start with the models and those were the series of the sketches on top. 
but it wasn't going as far. I couldn't get to the end of the style gans. It just started like bleaching out the paintings. So I'm going to try to see um, if I can revisit that because I do want to create more of a sequence of using them. Um, but eventually I tried to change the way I was thinking about it. So instead of just trying to take that initial sketch and then run it through uh, the combination of it, I tried to split the individual types of schematic sketches to run different filters on it. So that maybe I can run an initial sketch, have four networks trained to output four different results that could be lined up side by side and compared. And then from there, it would be a selection process with the analysis for the concept development. And those will be organized based on um, types of colors. So they can be grouped, categorized to create more data sets. So this would be like one data set. That would be another data set. And then this one could be this data set. And so I started working from this type of data set uh, over here that um, because uh, it takes quite a while, I didn't get as far as I would want to. This is at uh, 200 epochs. But um, I need to definitely go more into the thousands. But the cycle GAN is. Uh, it's not there as of yet, but um, I'm hoping from here to try to see how far I can take the cycle GAN, and um, I'm going to try to revisit the style GAN as well because in the end I really want to try to get. Uh, I wanted to. The reason why I went with the faces or with the, the the sketches for the style GAN is that I really wanted to try to create a style GAN with an interpolated video. Um, in in the end, um, so then I can run maybe like a video with two videos of sketches and. Uh, two style GANs of sketches and a style GAN of the paintings, and then try to run those with the cycle GAN and see if I can get uh, a video that matches or, or tries to create that connection between the pair data so that eventually I can have a system that I can create a sketch, feed it into the system, and then it would give me that uh, that filtered uh, compute, the GANs vision on top overlaid it to give it new information for analysis for uh, uh, architectural conceptualization. So, so that's where it, it is uh, right now. Um, that, that's I'd great like to work. be further along, but that's, that's where it that's is. Great. That's great work either way. Um, I think for one week, it's still great work. Um, how many how many uh, samples do you have right now of domain sketches? Or well, I took, um, or originally I had about, well, the original samples themselves, I had about like um, 26. Some were very low resolution, so I had to clean them up. I only went to the high resolution ones now. I have um, the, the orange samples, if I share them back so I can show them um, over here. So, uh, so for these samples, I have basically these three. These are 1024, uh, and then these are also 1024. Uh, but I tried to use the, the augmenter and to, like out of these, I was able to develop a hundred samples. So the ones that I currently had training was I had a hundred, a uh, hundred of these and a hundred of the sketches where you can see it over here. Uh, these were basically a series of uh, 17 sketches and I augmented to turn into a hundred. And those are the ones that I was running into this, uh, to the cycle GAN. Okay, so, so I think I think here you need more more for sure you need more image more data a bigger data set yeah, for the cycle again, and I don't know uh, if if there is a way for you to uh, to be able to get in contact with uh, Tomain to have more of those uh, images and probably that would be also a good thing because uh, it's also a question of probably copyright or something uh, if we if we are allowed like or. Yeah, if we are allowed to use this kind of, you know, work from uh, from domain, you know, to have AI generating something. So probably that will be also a safe bet to say, okay, I'm also having a larger data set because I get in contact with the domain and maybe I can get more of those images. And at the same time, you also solve this thing with, uh, with the copyright, yeah? But I think right now, yes, that's, that's the main thing. And in your case, you really need a larger data set, yeah? And, uh, how you can go about it, probably you can start first to uh, generate your data sets with the style GAN. And then once you have the style GAN uh, learning the representation of your uh, data sets, then you use those data sets for, for uh, cycle GAN, yeah? I will say cycle GAN, you need to go above uh, 1,500. I know that the research paper, uh, the original cycle GAN, they are saying that they use something like 200, 400 images. Uh, personally, uh, my all my experiments that I ran with uh, with uh, cycle GAN, they have to go above uh, 1,500, 2,000, or 3,000, something like that, to really have some quality results. 
Otherwise, if you just keep 200, uh, 400, I don't really think that it's working that well. So um, in, in that instance, for example, then you really have to um, maybe, you have, let's say 100, 200 images of, of domain sketches, yeah, and then you can augment them a bit to uh, 500 to 1,000, let's say. But then those, you use them in a style gap. And uh, the style again will just learn the representation, yeah, the underlying representation of those images. And then afterwards, you can generate as many, you know, samples as you want, yeah, for the cycle gap, you know. And it's almost like those uh, those samples that you're going to generate. It's almost like they are a sort of augmentation. I mean, you can use yeah, style again as a sort of augmentation technique, yeah. So like that, uh, you know, in a way, you you have results that are resembling more or less the same but they are slightly in a way you know stretch or something yeah or um yeah slightly different yeah so that will be that will be my uh, advice there we you have to figure out a way to make those style guns work and also not style guns, sorry cycle guns and also the resolution of it right now i think uh, you were saying you ran it for 5000 epochs that's a uh, lot. Yes, yeah. those were at 256 by 256, a very low resolution so, to get them yeah, that high. Yeah, so then it's meaningless that if you run it at 5,000, yeah. I have a, a network that ran for 900 epochs and the, the results are just extremely beautiful, you know. So yours right now, they are not even getting close to that. So uh, I, I think it's a matter of resolution. Yeah, it, it, you can, and you have to understand it that Yes, you as a human, you are able to look at 256, 256 and you know, see the beauty in the image. But the network, like I said, is looking at relations. The less pixels you have, less relations you have. Yeah, So less is going to be able to understand certain things. So um, then if you if you go with the resolution above 512, I think then you are, you'll start to have some, some uh, interesting results, yeah. Yes, I guess that would be the hurdle because so far <clears throat> I have uh, like 30 of the images, but only six of them are 1024 by 1024. And yeah. uh, that's the problem with the. So I'll try to see yeah, how so I can you go are going to, that. Probably on, on Collab, you're going to be able to run just um, 512 or 600 resolution, probably. You need a 24 gigs uh, graphic card to be able to mm -hmm. run uh, 7, 740, for example. Uh, but you, on a cycle again, you're going not, not going to be able to run it 1024 for sure. You know. Okay. So but it's still, it still is good to to run or to have the data set 1024, and then when you load it into the network, you load it at low, a lower resolution. Yeah, it's better than to just have the images uh, straight up like lower resolution. I see. Uh, Nico, I think I think we can we can have try I'll try and put you in touch with that with the office. I mean. Um, there, there was an exercise that was done by, I forget his name, Daniel Prusko or something like that. It was, um, and it was just straightforward grasshopper, right? But there was kind of mutations in a theme and they have a hundred different variations that were produced. And this blue, um, blue uh, Tom Main away. What I actually it was almost identical. This was almost 12 months ago. I went around to the office to go and talk about all these things. And I mean, Tom takes a view that grasshopper, well, grasshopper is a kind of early form, low, good old fashioned AI kind of thing in some senses, but it's not really very advanced. And when I was showing him the sort of work that was coming out from the studio this time last year, he was kind of scratching his head and saying, what do I do with that? Because I can't control it. You know, and the little problem about style GANs is really for someone like Tom Main, who who starts off the other way around with this kind of this kind of inspirational sketch, is, is he's, he's kind of controlling it all along. And, and, and the issue of control becomes a uh, central for him. But um, let, I'll, I'll try and set something up and we'll see what we can, we can do with that. So um, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, even if it's an email, hopefully, if he takes a read on it, I'm sure he's a very busy guy. Uh, I, but hopefully, I can get him interested in this type of research. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. He is interested in that. I mean, absolutely. I mean, we saw this debate between Wolf and Tom. Uh, I, but I'll go through someone else who's not directly through Tom himself to, to introduce things. So, so let's see what can happen. Um, and I think that will be an amazing, you know, like also for you, Nico, as a master student. Yeah, it's going to be an amazing, you know, opportunity to to get in contact you know, with kind of offices. I think that yes, uh, that would be that would be very huge. I, I'd really uh, appreciate that. And I'll put my gratitude for for you, Professor Leach, if you can get me in contact. <laughs> I can't guarantee anything else because I know- Sorry, Neil. Sorry, Neil. Now we have to do it. <laughs> letting off people in the office. I know a few people. I 
<laughs> contacts there and no longer have jobs there. So, but uh, anyway, no, we'll see. But uh, I, I mean, he is, Tom is incredibly generous as an individual, as a personality. I mean, as a teacher, he is, I mean, the reports back from the students, they, they can't believe this guy running a kind of Pritzker Prize winning office is, is so generous with his time. But let's, let's see what we can do. Um, it, any, any kind of further comments? Um, if not, Evo, uh, do you want to get ready to, to present? And uh, could someone volunteer to go after Evo? Evo? Yeah, I got you. Let me share my screen here. Uh, okay. All right. Can you see that? Yeah. Now again. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So my idea was to combine simple geometric architectural features with organic landscapes. Um, uh, in order for the machine to dream up or hallucinate a distorted slash organic version of Louis Barragan's architecture, I specifically chose simple architectural forms in order to get a clear sense of uh, what the AI is actually doing. And uh, I trained 500, 500 images through StyleGAN, which translated natural landscapes into images that mimicked uh, Louis Barragan's buildings. So this is some of the images. And here is my video. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I got. How many epochs was that? Did you say sorry, Mr. Mr. No, I didn't. Um, I don't, I don't have that. Not sure. It took uh four hours. Okay. So how many how many images do you have in your data set? Five hundred. Okay. So uh, you'll have to go above that. Yeah. So I I will just uh, improve in this regard. So. Um, more than 500 yeah and then okay. i'll train more than uh, just uh, four hours yeah so this one will have to train more for you to really see some positive results and then also i'll really check back the uh, the quality of the data set yeah so right now you see that the the kind of results that you get here they are not very detailed they are not really giving you that much information and i have a feeling that you just have a few like four or five or ten maximum images and then you try to augment them out like to 500 or something, yeah. And I think that's in a way, uh, you don't have a lot of information that, you know, that the network can learn. And probably you have to expand on that. Yeah, you have to really um, uh, look at that specific type of architecture and really, um, um, you know, find more samples. And uh, let's say you have 200, 250 examples of that specific building or that kind of uh, Louis Barragan in a way architecture, and then you can go on and probably in, uh, augment. Yeah. So usually also with augmentation, I'll say you have, to, have you have to be careful. Like we cannot augment our way out here. Um, you can have let's say um, a sort of ratio of one to four. Let's say one image original, four augmented or something like that, or maximum five or something like that. But if you go very high out there probably you're not you're not really uh, helping at all you know the process and this depends uh, this kind of what i'm saying now with four or five depends now of course on on the type of data sets that or the type of tasks that you're trying to train you know for example if i have a if i have a, a network that has to identify a chair like object recognition then yeah probably i can make it multiply by eight one one real and eight uh, in a way uh, uh, augmented images of that, yeah, because I can have rotations, 90 degrees, flip, uh, left, right, top, bottom, and rotate, mirror, and so on, yeah. There are multiple of those that I can do. But here, in, I think right now, you don't, the network doesn't have the enough uh, information when it comes to, you know, the semantic information that's represented in the images, you know, to actually be able to learn. But I think that's, that's where you have to put your focus on. 
try to, to really develop like a, a very large 250 something like that let's say um, uh, data set with, uh, with the images of uh, this polynomial and then you can maybe augment that two or three times yeah that amount okay, okay. Uh, I'll make a note of that and yeah like I was saying then also the training has to has to to be longer yeah um, for sure the longer the longer you allow it of course some networks they will just collapse they will just fail yeah but usually uh, it's yeah you can you should leave it like run even if uh, even if you have this kind of style transfer that not style transfer sorry um, transfer learning that uh, it's already incorporated in the in the script that I share with you so that cuts in a way the training time from a few months is cutting it to uh, just a few days but still I will allow the network to train for about two two days or something out yeah, to three days to really have some uh, very good results okay perfect okay. thank you okay we don't have anyone lined up to go next who, who would like to go next um I guess I can show okay uh, it's nothing like the people before um don't, don't worry about that <laughs> <laughs> um okay so i was like literally just playing with it um seeing like understanding it writing down like all the steps uh making sure that i'm understanding this uh so this is just like me playing around with it um for cyclegan um i got it up to like 80 um epochs um, so I went for a really long time, but unfortunately, this, so these are the fake images that I'm just showing. Um, unfortunately, I came across an error, which was I tried like solving. Are you sharing problem. your screen? I think yeah, we, we, we are still seeing uh, Evo's uh, oh. screen right now. Evo, could you un unshare? Okay, cool, nice, you're right. Okay. Okay, so then, thank you. So then, started off with cycle again, let it like go up to like 80 epochs. These are only the fakes. Um, unfortunately, I ran into this uh, problem. Um, I ran into a problem before that, but got some help from my classmates. And then I couldn't, I wasn't going to like keep like spending my time on this. So I'm going to fix it later. Um, but that's where I ended with cycle again. Um, and then I st started style, uh, style again, and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. This has nothing to really do with my thesis as of right now. Um, but it was just testing to see if I can get through all the steps. Uh, so you were doing satellite images of mountains. I decided to do kind of like elevations or um, top views of mountains. Um, I let this run for 10 hours. Um, my computer I couldn't believe it is really fast. Um, so this is 10 hours. I know that if I spent longer on it, it could come out better. Um, these were just a few images um, that Style Gang created. And then I'm gonna share two of the videos I was just playing around with. You can see, right? Okay, and then that, that's one. And then the other one is this one. Um, where is it? Uh, sorry, my computer's dying real quick. Okay, and that one. Um, I realized with a few of the pictures I should have taken, I don't really know, like I'm still testing everything. Um, obviously there's a, there's a little bit of blue there just because of the sky. Maybe next time like I'll crop it differently. Um, I don't know. That's what I have. Um, and then I started doing my own experiments, but the resolution of the images came out really bad. Um, so I can tell what it is, um, but the pixel is just very tiny. Um, so I need to redo that. But that's what I have. Okay, so your cycle again um, experiments, I think they are, uh, they are looking very nice. Uh, and it's creating very interesting structure yeah, just based on those kind of labels. And the funny thing you see that the funny things, what I was showing in the workshop, uh, the intention was to look at the satellite image and create the labeling on it, yeah? Mm -hmm. And right now, actually, all of you that you're showing images with Barcelona, you're showing exactly the other direction. From a label to, uh, to a, uh, you know, a satellite image of Barcelona. But even that, that thing is very interesting because it's almost like 
uh, what you were drawing then in uh, Grasshopper, you just uh, draw the, uh, the structure of the city, let's say, and then you just ask the network to translate that kind of information, yeah. Um, when it comes to style again, I think you have a similar uh, um, challenge with uh, Evo, where uh, I, th I don't think you have the data set very robust at the moment. And yeah. that's why in a way the, uh, the result, they, they are very, very cloudy in a way. They, they, don't, they, they don't show a lot of detail and you know, precision. So if you remember the data set that I showed during the workshop, uh, for me, it just took something like one hour or something like that. So um, I just like uh, using uh, uh, Google Earth and I have this huge uh, screen at home, uh, 4K screen that I can just take screenshots, yeah, like that. And then once I take the screenshot, I have high resolution images, yeah. And then yeah. I just, I think I just saved something like four or five of those images and then I just started to crop them. But I started to crop in a way an image that is very high resolution in the end, yeah. So like that, I was able to uh, to go to 2000, for example, um, exa 2000 samples in my data set, yeah. Okay. So I think in your case, the same thing is like, you have to find like high resolution images if you want to crop and, you know, augment like that, and then build up a data set that is quite robust, yeah. And you saw that, I mean, the results, that the, the example that I showed in class last time, were super stunning, yeah. And just you know, I just waited something like uh, I don't know, seven hours, eight hours, or something like that. And you see, it mostly has to do with the data set, how high quality the data set is. And then, of course, okay, um, if if the network is able to learn from the amount that you have, yeah, like the uh, the size of the data set. Thank you. So yeah, in in those size, I would say that's that's where you have to focus to really have the networks in a way. Uh, output. I had, yeah, yeah, sorry. I had the four images um, and I mean, the resolution was really high. It was like a thousand something by a thousand something. I guess it's not, but I do need more images than that. I would guess I was just ha having a hard time finding like a good website, um, but it's still- Yeah, so high resolution personally, I will, I will call like from 4,000 up, mm -hmm. something like okay. 4,000 yeah. by something okay. you know because that that will really allow you to to have crops around and so on yeah perfect thank you Th thanks Maria. i mean well well done i mean you, you had a go and uh, it's all about your work it's about dreaming okay at some point so uh, <laughs> roxana christopher and then nicole um sure here about, you. about dreaming if you think about dreaming dreaming is super interesting because we we always uh or maybe we think of dreaming at something that it's fixed when actually I dreamt something like uh, last night, but today when I start to interpret the dream, suddenly the dream, it's uh, getting a, a different shape or gets a different shape, yeah? So suddenly the dream is changing while I'm talking about it or something, yeah? It's not the same dream that I had, you know? It's a dream, the interpretation of the dream or something, you know? It's almost like uh, I'm hallucinating my own dream in the end. It sounds like a style guide. It's just carrying on. <laughs> okay, um, Roxana. Uh, yeah, let me share my screen. Okay, basically, I concentrated in style guides after watching everything. I decided like this is going to be more technologically on my capabilities that I could go into. Uh, I try to do the mountains and I had some glitches also with the cycle bands. Um, but like I started getting like uh, my data set, like I try to do like maybe about 50, 60 pictures that I found of forests. And uh, these were like some of the results that I got here on the left side. And what I was, I really liked was the textures actually that I got from some of the pictures. And then I guess I'll run the interpolative video. And that's it. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first results, do, uh, those were uh, cycle GANs or? No, no, uh, I did style GANs. Um, the ones that you had in PDF? Yeah, like these are some of the data set. I still have like, I have a oh, big one here, um, but I just introduced like a little bit of them. Where am I? Yeah, so I think in yeah. case, mm -hmm. it's a good example of um, yeah, the data set that you have, it's a bit more homogeneous and that's why in a way the style, the style again, it's able to, to create the interpolations uh, better, yeah. So if you use Augmenter, probably, uh, were you using Augmenter here? Or? Yeah, I got um, 2,200 uh, pictures out of the first ones that I, I put okay. in. And then I run the data set based on that. I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering if, um, uh, I'll be curious in a way to see the actual data set because I see, for example, this frame that you have right now in the video, you see that it's a bit very cloudy, like blurry yeah. somehow. Mm -hmm. Is not very defined, and I'm just wondering if that kind of uh, image is not uh, well represented in your data set, yeah? Because then we can use Augmenter and we can augment and crop and do whatever we do with Augmenter with images, but still, it's not going to be enough in a way. Yeah, um, I have. And also, also we we haven't talked about this, but it's also a good idea to try to to balance in a way. Um, Let's say if you have this type of forest, the one that's more green, and then you have the other one that's more orange. Maybe right. you want to have mm -hmm. maybe you want to have let's say two hundred examples of green, two hundred examples of orange, two hundred examples of something else. Yeah, so almost like to balance. Let's say because otherwise, what could happen is that there is going to be a strong bias towards the the, the uh, forest that has the most images in the data set. Yeah. Yeah, they're all that. here. Like it just it ranged. I try to do a range of of pictures of colors to see mm -hmm. if I think the orange probably is like lower down. And yeah, so we have mm -hmm. we can also look at it like that. Yeah, so if you really have this kind of specific like kind of scenarios of forest of of uh, forest, then you can have like uh, you use augmenter just on one image. Yeah, you take okay. one image and you create augmentations, like let's say 200 augmentations from, from one image, and then you take the other one 200, the other one 200, and afterwards yeah. you put everything together, yeah? But like that, at least you'll have things that are a bit more balanced, you know? Otherwise, okay. you just have one that is overpowering all the other ones, you know, so. Yeah, that's what I figured. Um, okay, great, I mean, this is, this is the easiest way without introducing other, um, usually these are like a data, data set topology in a way it's called the app, like you have to understand how the data set is distributed and um, there are ways in a way to display uh, the data set, yeah? Like for example, you can look at every single image, understand it as an image, as a composition, as a, you know, as content and then try to, to figure out how, uh, how that uh, sits together with the rest of the images that you have in your data set, yeah? And if you have, for example, a data set that is very scattered, then probably uh, that's going to be uh, something more difficult for network to learn. Yeah? If you have it more homogeneous, probably it's much easier. Yeah. So um, without going in those kind of topics, yeah, we can control maybe the data set in this kind of way where we are aware of, we should be careful and have just this amount of you know images for this type, this amount for this type, this amount for this type, yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect, thank you so much. You're welcome. So Christopher, do you want to go next? Yeah, I can go. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the things that I fell in love with, um, with the workshop and, and me uh, learning how to use the, the GAN was um, kind of the process behind it is very process driven. So um, the way I laid out my presentation was just kind of going through through that process. <clears throat> so I first started off with a cycle GAN with the Barcelona data set. And here I'm, I'm showing the, the first um, epoch um, as you can see, the, the fakes and the reels. And the, the way I kind of structured it is that um, to show you the, the, first, um, the first epoch, and then I, I got up to 200. So um, I'm showing like the start point, the mid, and um, the end. 
So that, that's what it looked like um, during 100. And this is what it looked like um, on its last one on 200. It stopped after 200. I'm not sure if it was supposed to do that or, um, but yeah. And this is just um, a video where I, I stitched together all of the fakes um, from start to finish. And then it just loops at, at a certain uh, point. So um, I'm here, I'm just showing some of my favorite ones, um, kind of showing how, how different it could interpret the city and how streets can turn into these huge landscapes. I thought that was really interesting and how it almost starts to distort the grid and kind of like curve it um, in uh, Epoch 182. I, I kind of, I, I like that. Um, so then I, I went into StyleGAN with the, the data set of the mountains um, that, that Daniel um, gave to us. So it started off with the faces and then midway it started to finally learn and understand um, how, how to, to get trained the, to produce the mountains. And then this was the last one. Um, it was a snapshot 303, the network. And for some reason, this video in my play, um, I'm not sure if you guys can see it, but it's just basically the, the start to finish from that training um, that I did. These are my favorite seeds from, from that set. I think they're really beautiful. And then I just started to um, run the, the truncations and um, the interpolations on them. This was uh, one of the, the ways that I blended two seeds that I, I really found interesting. And this is a, another truncation. Uh, well, it's a truncation uh, 0.95, but it's a, an inter, an interpolate uh, radius. And then the, the more I started to um, look at these and what I was starting to generate, um, I started to think about what I wanted to produce out of it. Um, and I, I started to think about one of my favorite painters. Uh, his name is uh, Jackson Pollock. And I'll show you, I'll show you now. But this was the, the last uh, interpolate that I, I produced from that data set. So I thought it, I thought it'd be um, it would be a good idea to trip to um, transfer that training from the mountains to uh, Jackson Pollock's um, work, and it started off again like with the mountains, and then midway it finally started to understand um, how to paint like Jackson Pollock, and it's funny I, I, Jackson Pollock died in 1957, and it's almost as if you know he came back to life. I don't think that one played, but that's okay. So these are my favorite seeds. Um, really starting to look like a painting. I think it was. I think it was a good outcome. Um, and then these are just um, the truncation uh, traversals that were produced. This was a blended seed example. On the left was uh, seed 4431.4052 and the other one. And then in the middle is the blender. And this is just an, another uh, interpolate radio from that uh, Jackson Pollock set. These are uh, linear interpolates. So 
Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure how how much different that I was noticing that some of these were starting to look very similar, um, and I wanted to know how I would maybe be able to to change that, or maybe it's that because I need to train it more. I'm not really sure, but um, this was. I think this is the last one that I, I produced. Thank you, Christopher. I think I think you had a lot of fun. Yeah. Or I hope. <laughs> I, I mean, it has to be fun. Otherwise, if if you don't have fun, don't do it. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I think you had a lot of fun, and um, I, I think that shows in a way you tried a lot of like uh, things, a lot of experiments, and I think it's also a good um, approach to okay, I train the network, and I think you understood the concept of you know once you have a network trained, you can use that network and start from there on yeah the other uh, data set yeah so similar what you did with uh, the paintings yeah um, so um here right now mostly you're you're working with with the style again yeah so you were showing at the beginning some results from the from the cycle again so the reason why the cycle again stopped it has in a way a um a learning not learning rate um, um it has in a way a mechanism in a way to uh, to reduce to reduce in a way the number of uh, of um, iteration that you you have. So, for example, I think it's called if you if you type in in the line of code where you have uh, Python train .pi, If you type in something like double dash and uh, i t t e r, and then you put in a higher value there, then probably it's going to continue more now. So, um, so it's mostly about an optimizer that you have in the network, yeah? and that optimizer starts from a certain value, and then after 100 epochs, it starts to decrease, yeah. And once it starts to decrease and it gets to zero, when it gets to zero, then you know that the epoch uh, stops, yeah, or the training stops, yeah. So that's that's why you just have to change there a small small uh, parameter or argument into into that line there, yeah. So it's n. I T T E R, and I think then you just put. Uh, I think if you put four hundred, I think that that's going to uh, increase. Yeah. Uh, so um, when it comes to interpolation, so right now most of, if you look at linear interpolation or just uh, interpolation or a linear uh, uh, W walk, those are pretty much uh, similar. Only because you're still dealing with a linear uh, uh, interpolation, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you compare the circular with the linear, then you'll see a, a bigger this uh, bigger difference, yeah. And mostly because um, what you're doing there is just you know you're just walking from one to another more or less, yeah, in a linear manner. Versus the other one, it's circles around, yeah. So if you want to go into into actually changing that, it's mostly you have to go into the code and change stuff. Yeah, how exactly how exactly uh, the interpolation happens? Yeah, if it's a linear or not. Yeah, uh, there I think there there was also another option there. Um, I think in the in the script that I share with you that allows you also for a, a more noisy interpolation. It's still linear, but it's a bit more noisy. Yeah, it's almost like jumping. Uh, uh, along the curve yeah so you have a curve and almost yeah you have a sort of offset and within that kind of offset you have a random uh, noisy in a way interpolation yeah um, so um, mostly mostly uh, when it comes to interpolations and stuff um, and latent space walk uh, it's a it's something that you have access to just code yeah if you type it in yeah, coding um, but yeah, right now the ones that I share with you, I think they just have these two modes, like linear or circular. So, but what you can try to do is like to to explore a bit more. I think you have those kind of options of the radius of the circular um, interpolation, and then you have also the truncation values or other kind of uh, uh, parameters. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. 
Yeah, that was that was you had fun. I mean, I think Jackson Pollock was having fun too. I mean, <laughs> he's like he's one of his crazies. Um, okay, so we got Nicole, Mario, Adriana. Um, yeah, Nicole. Um, so I was using StyleGAN, and I was using as my base. Hang, on, I'm trying to find my video to share the screen. Okay, um, and I used uh, like wasp wasp nest and bees nest. Um, if you have a fear of holes, I feel like you shouldn't watch it because I forgot it's like what phobia that is. So that's just like your pre-warning here. So my diploma was the same and everyone was making this kind of jokes and comments about my diploma. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is my, I made a few videos and this is my second favorite. Um, And then this one is the one I liked um, the best. Oops. No, I think it's the same one. You might have to unshare it and, and try again. What did you say? I'm sorry. Yeah, you have. Are you, are you, we see the same one. You have to unshare it and then and share again to get the other another video. Oh. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, sorry. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. Uh, what kind of resolution did you use for this, for the um, star game? Um, honestly, I don't remember. Some of my base files, um, as I went and through it and was using Augmenter and all that stuff, I think one of them was a pretty low resolution. And I had a couple that were high. And then, yeah. Yeah, so I think I think that's that's something that uh, needs to be worked on and try to try to have images that are a good quality and try to have quite the same images, the same kind of quality, huh? uh, because that's going to like create a lot of noise then in the, in the uh, training and um, you, you'll end up with this kind of like results that sometimes they, they sh look very sharp, sometimes they are very, very uh, noisy in a way. Uh, and then uh, I think that kind of play of different scales, I think probably that's also interesting, like to have different cells at different uh, scales. Um, but yeah, I think that that's the main uh, concern here now, like uh, the resolution of it, yeah. Um, right now, I think the, the one that I share with you, that pre-trained network, I think it has a, a 512 to 1024 or something like that, yeah. If you go below that, probably it's going to create uh, uh, some issues. So yeah, I would say that's where you should focus, yeah. Try to, to build up a data set that it's quite, and probably also saw that the range when you created the video, you saw also the range of your data set, yeah. Probably try to, to have a data set that is very, very diverse and that is very, in a way, um, high resolution, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. I'm, I'm glad you threw yourself in at this. I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a foreign territory, but I think you guys have had fun. Okay, so um, let's go Mario, Adriana, Andre, and then Edgar. Hello, how's it going? Um, so for my data set, I chose to do our experiment um, with corals. My data set was around 800 photos. Um, and that took about 17 and a half hours. Um, I actually ran it for about four hours before this final iteration. 
and there was an issue. So I was hoping that I could use that network um, link that you had given us to continue it, but I unfortunately got a couple errors. So I just had to start fresh. Um, but you can see that the, the faces were definitely changed pretty, pretty nicely. And these are just some, um, some samples a little bit closer up. Have the videos here. I don't know if you guys can hear audio. Show the audio, the computer audio. Oh, do, do I do it at the top here? Uh, yeah, I think so. Is it under view options? I'm not sure. We can't hear at the moment. Do we? Maybe it's not here. Oh, I think I had to. Probably when you share it, you have to. Yeah, yeah. Let me try again. Share sound. Here it is. And I tried it with a second one just to give it another shot. I really tried with like 10, but these were the two that I liked the most. What kind, of what kind of resolution did you have for the data set? So the original photos were, I believe, 3840 by 24 or something. They were pretty high resolution. Um, but for some reason, they ended up getting a little bit fuzzy. Yeah, so that, that's why I was asking, because those kind of blobs, in a way, uh, that result there uh, in the network, usually mm -hmm. they indicate that kind of problem with the data set. Um, so that's why I was asking. Um, so right now you're just randomly cropping, yeah? Yeah, there's a random crop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just I'm just wondering in a way. Probably you should um, you should some, uh, you should spend some time to look at the data set at the original images, and try to in a way uh, identify if some of those images have information that is not really relevant to this idea of coral, yeah. And maybe just exclude them those parts. Yeah, it might be that you know you have in one side of the image you have coral, and then you have a lot of like sea or something. Yeah, water. Yeah, and probably that. So I actually relevant. I tried to weed those out as best as I could. Like if there was any empty space, I would remove it. Um, remove it so how? Like uh, crop? Just delete or? it. Like remove it from the folder so that it's not in the data set. Okay. Okay. I tried to get as many with just polyps or you know, the actual coral as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's something that the strange happening. How, how many images did you add in the end in the data set? 800 images um, okay. and it ran for like so, 17 and a half hours. So I'll say, try to push them above, yeah. And uh, above uh, a thousand, uh, the ones that I showed last time, I had the data set with uh, 2000 uh, images, yeah, the one with that. Mm -hmm. uh, satellite images of a uh, of mountains. Um, so um, in your case, because you work with corals up and down, it doesn't really matter. It's mostly about the, the pattern that it's creating. So mm -hmm. because of that, you can play quite a lot with the augmentation, like up and down, left and right, and so on. Yeah? So um, that should allow you to go to 2,000 or even higher than 2,000 yeah? uh, samples. Um, but I think okay. that that will really help them, will really help the, the training. So um, and then, even and maybe if you have another this, thing, another uh -huh. thing that you also can try to do is um, um, maybe you look at different types of corals first, yeah, and you learn in a way those types of corals. 
and afterwards you output a lot of uh, images within that type of corals and then later you start to combine them yeah and let's say you have two style let's say you have two types of corals you have two style can uh, networks that are training for each type and they're going to output let's say thousands of images yeah just for that type and then you combine those yeah, you combine those and you have them uh, as a data set for a different style again that is looking uh, is going to look at all of them yeah so in that way probably uh, you can end up with a very interesting like you know uh, almost like crossbreeding let's say between between the two types you know but i think for for something like that to happen you really need to have like the first type the second type very well represented yeah Okay. Is that making sense? Yeah, and I heard you mention earlier something about colors. Um, in this case, there was plenty of different colors. Does it really matter? Uh, should I have done maybe like a, a training for, you know, green and then separately done blue or whatever? Uh, not necessarily. In, in your case, uh, the corals, they are so colorful that uh, it's hard to, to separate the, uh, things mm -hmm. like that, yeah. Okay. But in that instance, for example, you have the same kind of like... Uh, the content you are still dealing with trees and leaves and so on it's just that the color the color palette in a way it's completely different yeah you have a green uh, green forest or you have an orange forest or yellow forest or something else so the the content was still the same in your case i think also the content is changing yeah so you have super colorful and also the shape of the of the coral uh, changes and so on so in that instance i will not really deal with that i'll just deal with like what exactly you're trying to, to learn, yeah, or what you're trying to ask the network to learn. So if you're asking certain types, then okay, I'm just going to show those kind of types, yeah. So that's that's how I uh, look at it. Great, looking okay. forward to continue trying it out. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Mario, congratulations. I think you kind of threw yourself at it and uh, had a go at things, um, you know, and, and you've got something out of this. Yeah, it's, it's great. Um, it was yeah. definitely it was definitely fun to uh, to try it out and get my feet wet. Uh, yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, Adriana. Um, uh, then um, um, on, Andre, Edgar, and Julia. Um, can Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I used um, Van Gogh paintings, um, and um, looking back, I do regret not choosing a more varied color palette because I think that would have been a little bit more interesting. But oh well. Sorry, um, sorry for keep repeating Van Gogh during the workshop. I hope I didn't influence you to go with Van Gogh. No, it's the <laughs> uh, the texture is very interesting, and I I, I wanted to look at um, what uh, new scenery would be generated um, through this texture. So um, these are some of my cycle gang samples. I put the real next to the fake. <clears throat> um, the resolution on them is not that good. Also, another thing I would tackle um, in my next run of this. Um, and it was Definitely, the truncation difference was definitely there. It was definitely present. I found that super interesting as well. Um, you can start to see that it starts to make new landscape. And I was just, uh, I just, I, I really enjoyed this. <laughs> this is a very fun project to do and work on. Um, these were the, uh, let me, okay, um, these were the, the style again, um, seeds that I used for the video. And the video I find super cool because there's a bunch of different landscapes in there.
And I also I really enjoyed this how the circular looked to me. Um, yeah. I, I personally just really enjoyed this. <laughs> So you're working also with cycle again, yes? The, the first ones that you showed, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think I think this is a general comment that I'm keep uh, making. I think it's mostly, yeah, the, uh, mostly all the task is on how we build up data sets and how clean they are and how well representative they are of, uh, of what we are trying to represent, yeah? Um, so uh, the same also in the Van Gogh, for example. Although the Stalgan uh, results were interesting, yeah, but they were not really necessarily resembling, let's say, a Van Gogh, or at least uh, you know uh, you will not see that kind of palettes and those kind of textures that normally you'll have in the Van Gogh. And probably it just has to do with you know the, the type of images that you fit in, the type of examples from Van Gogh, um, you know. Um, the resolution of them, like how many you have there. Um, how, how many did you use right now for the stallion, for example? How many uh, samples, images? Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember. There was just okay. so many numbers of things. Okay, so yeah, because probably that's, that's something that plays a big role, yeah. So if you have this kind of like pre-trained in a way, um, network like the one that I share with you um, and then you just uh, transfer learning from it and you continue the training from uh, from the pre-trained network then you still need something like 2000 3000 uh, kind of images to really really have some very uh, good results yeah uh, of course if you go even higher than that probably you're going to have even uh, better results but you know to get towards that threshold where you know the results they look very good and they are really representative of uh, of the data set that you are uh, presenting uh, you, you need to to bring it up to something like that yeah so here you see it's exactly the the uh, problem that I was describing during the workshop with Van Gogh yeah it's very hard to create Van Gogh you know so uh, yeah there are certain pa paintings so how do you create extra new paintings yeah so the idea here, I think for you will be very, if you really want to create Van Gogh and in the end, like have a style game that really outputs uh, extremely amount of time, uh, extreme amount of time will have to be dedicated for, you know, finding exactly uh, paintings that are high resolution. And then, okay, what's the augmentation strategy, which is the proper co cropping of, of this, yeah. Because it could be that right now you're just cropping very small, yeah, and because of that, then all the results they are mostly detailed kind of results, yeah. But what if you have a larger crop, yeah? Maybe that one once you have a larger crop, you are also going to see like some uh, compositional in a way um, uh, learning, let's say, of the network. So the network will output something that deals also with composition, not so much just with with texture or um, uh, yeah, texture or style in that kind of sense, yeah. So I think here you, you have like, you have to play a bit with it. I understand that probably Van Gogh is not that easy to find like a lot of, uh, a lot of high resolution images, but if you continue with, with Van Gogh, yeah, you have to figure out a way that maybe you can look also at, uh, at super, there are certain networks that allow you to uh, for x for example, uh, an image, yeah. Of course, it's not the most ideal in a way a solution, but in case that you don't have any other option to get your hands on a, a very high quality data set, yeah, high resolution data set of Van Gogh, maybe that's an option, yeah. You have, let's say, images of Van Gogh that are like 512, and then you scale them up four times, yeah, and then you are able to crop them or something, yeah. So uh, if you're looking at super resolution, uh, uh, you'll see that I think there's SR again, or how it's called, or something like that. I can share it, perhaps with uh, uh, with Neil, and Neil can share it with everyone. But there are a few networks out there, yeah, that uh, deal just with that, yeah, just increase the resolution of an image, yeah. 
uh, without in a way, you know, having this kind of uh, uh, pixels, you know, showing up uh, large then, okay? Um, but yeah, that that's uh, that's where the focus should be, okay? Okay, thank you. Well done, Adriana. Um, that you've, you've had a go. It was great. Uh, Andre, uh, Edgar, and Yulia. It's someone, else, someone else I'm missing, I think. I'm trying to remember the name I'm missing. Okay, I'm um, going uh, share my screen. Um, are you seeing my presentation? Yep. Oh, okay. Perfect. So, um, I, my name is Andre. Um, I'm going to present to you my GANs explorations. And so uh, I really like the idea or the thought that an AI can hallucinate and create uh, creative outputs. And so this whole idea of hallucination uh, was a large part of uh, Dali and the way that he went about his paintings. So he had, uh, he worked on the principle of the paranoid critical method, which is a, a mental state in which uh, deep paranoia and anxiety uh, create hallucinations. And then he takes these visions or these hallucinations and then brings them into physical form into his art. And so then he tries to kind of rationalize the irrational. And so uh, in this case, he has a uh, very recognizable characteristics such as the landscape, the sky, the clouds. And so the idea is to take a cumulative set of data that has this uh, type of characteristics and try to tap back into uh, those, I, I would say initial hallucinations. And so it's kind of just bringing it back to how would those hallucinations look like? So this is the data set uh, create that I created for this specific uh, exercise. And so these are the results or the hallucinations that I got from that specific data set. And there's some recognizable figures and uh, some motifs that are, um, I guess you could say, uh, very recognizable in his paintings. And so uh, this is a, a video of interpolation between the different images from this data set that was trained on the initial faces. And so the face is then translated into his paintings or into this hallucination of his paintings. Um, and uh, you can see it, there's, there's some problems with the resolution on this one because I didn't really clean up the data set as well as I should have. But then I learned that for the for the next uh, for the next type of exercise that I want to go into. So really thinking about uh, the hallucinations and how much your environment can affect your subconscious and conscious state. So the idea of Catalonia, which is uh, Barcelona, whereas uh, Dali is from, um, I wanted to maybe dive a little bit into the idea of what it could be or could Dali be an architect? And so it's taking uh, this initial trained set uh, of data that produce these outputs, which are uh, in a way very recognizable, although the ones on the left that were created by the previous data set. And so used, I used that trained set to then um, create images from uh, Catalan uh, structures in Badara in Barcelona, everywhere from Enric Miralles, uh, to uh, to uh, Gauli. So it's a mixture of both uh, contemporary and traditional architecture of Barcelona. And so the results are were quite interesting. And you can see uh, where the data is getting driven from. And so these are the outputs that I got. And this one, you can see the correlation of of kind of like the stilts and the different things that are present in the architecture. And this is an, kind of an interesting facade that I created. And then uh, perhaps this is my favorite one and it's taking all the motifs of the clouds and, and the balconies and the, the, the windows and it's creating kind of an ephemeral building that's almost uh, becoming clouds, like the clouds of the paintings. 
And so I thought that was really interesting. And uh, this is uh, more variations with different blendings and truncations. And uh, here's uh, uh, the last video. This is just like a, a blend of all, of all the outputs from that data set. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So here, mostly you're we're using um, you're using StyleGAN, yes. Yeah. Style. And here you just started to combine in a way uh, Dali with uh, Catalan uh, like architecture. Yeah. Is that correct. Okay. Uh -huh. So yeah, here what I will say. Okay, this is it's interesting as a as a experiment uh, and probably. The same kind of discussion like make sure your data set is rob robust enough then if you use this kind of dali and uh, uh catalan architecture probably also try to have similar like amount let's say thousand images catalan architecture a thousand dali or something yeah so that could be one experiment but what one uh, another experiment that i'll suggest you to, to to do is also try to look at the cycle again because uh, what I showed with the cycle again last class, and uh, we didn't have time to go in more detail, different ways how you can look at cycle again. So last class, I we were just saying, well, in case that you don't have a pair data set, how can you create a pair data set? Yeah, in a more automatic, let's say, way without manually annotating you know, the data. Um, so we were saying we can use a uh, unsupervised method, somehow a cycle again that will learn to create this kind of translation and create the labels, yeah? Uh, but you can also use a cycle again, uh, just saying, you know, I have DALI and I have Catalan architecture on the other side. Look at both domains, understand the, uh, the underlying, in a way, representation of the two domains and then create translations yeah, between the two. Yeah, so uh, at the beginning uh, today, I was saying, you know, that personally, I, I consider cycle again to be the most creative uh, network uh, from the networks that I showed here. And mostly, you know, it's, I, I just see the process that the network tries to engage in as being more creative and more similar in a way with what we are doing. And it's also going to create something that is outside of the data set we, that we input, yeah? Creating something completely new outside of data set when uh, style again is mostly creating interpolations or, you know, these kind of things, which are defined by the data set, yeah? So here, I think will be very interesting, yeah, to to really look at the leaves uh, surrealism in a way and then you know look at Catalan architecture and see how, how you bring in a way that kind of uh, uh, super structure uh, rigid in a way architecture to this kind of like Dali in a way you know surrealism or something you know so I think that that uh, a cycle again probably will have a um, you'll have more fun with the cycle again yeah probably than uh, with the style again but you should try to run both of them. Yeah, try to run both of them. Have the style again more uh, balanced in terms of uh, data set. Yeah, and then try also an experiment with cycle again. Yeah, and you'll see that cycle again is going to just go nuts. It's going to be crazy, like super interesting interpretations that you'll never think of. You know, because it's going to look at the composition from uh, buildings and composition from Dali. And then it's going to create this kind of super interesting uh, translations between the two, yeah. So yeah, style GAN, a cycle GAN can be used, you know, very pragmatic, like I showed uh, previous class, but it can be used in a very speculative way. And probably in that mode, it's more creative than other networks. Okay. Thank you. I'll definitely Thank try you. it out. Andre, that was great. You had fun. I mean, I just want to, <laughs> Dali did say something about architecture, right? He, he said that, the future of architecture will be soft and furry. And um, uh, there were some guys that has been projects based on that. I, I once said this to some guys in China and uh, I said, I think the future of architecture is gonna be soft and furry. It's probably gonna be like a panda. And for some reason, I don't know, this is broadcast everywhere for the next three years. I get people coming up to me asking me why architecture is gonna be like a panda, but it's probably a good thing to say because they were a bit uptight at the time. Of course, now the work they're producing is fantastic, but that was great. And I, I was, uh, keep going, that was fantastic. I mean. Uh, Edgar, uh, followed by Yulia. Thank you. Thanks.
Edgar? Oh, he's just, oh, he's just, I, I got to admit him. Okay, hold on a sec. Yeah. Hi. You, Edgar, we just, I just, uh, Hello? yeah, you ready to go? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I got kicked out from my iPad. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen now. There you go. Can you see? Hello? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is my presentation. I started with the one that we started the example with Daniel's. So this is the, the two that I did before actually blending that came out to this. And then I did the circle interpol, which I found pretty interesting. And then from there, I just went directly to what I was going to do myself which was coral reefs. I decided to do it on, on coral reefs itself. This is one of the one original images I used to train the data set. And these are the other ones I used. So I used, in total, I think it was nine that I used. And then this is the first reel came out. And then this next one, this one, I really started to like it when I started to mix it with the faces because it reminded me of like, Pirates of the Caribbean when, when the characters have like barnacles or algae growing on them. So I kind of liked it a lot, especially if you zoom into individual ones, it reminds me of that. Um, especially, I don't know if, if you can see my cursor, this guy right here, it kind of looks like he's like turning into like a crab. So I really liked that a lot. I thought about uh, running it with this, but I didn't. Um, this is some of the seeds that I actually liked itself. And then this is one of the truncations I did. And then the Interpol, I have no idea if you're gonna be able to hear the noise. Can you hear the noise? Yeah, slightly, but don't worry about it, don't worry. And then the second one I did was this one here. Which I'm kind of pleased with how it came out, but I learned afterwards that not to use images that have like just blue in it. Yes, this is what I so, want to say. <laughs> yeah, because there's like three seconds in each one where it's just blue, and I don't like that at all. But if I'm going on further with this, and I learned that now not to do that. Yeah, so I think um, um, pro probably Neil told you about the coral morphology. Mm -hmm. And maybe there you can find like high quality resolution uh, for for this kind of corals. Um, or maybe another thing will be depends now what you are looking for. You know, if you are just looking for purely like aesthetics and colors of this kind of corals, then yes, you can okay use this kind of images of corals. But if you are in interested actually in the, the structure of the coral and those kind of patterns that are created. Maybe a better idea is to uh, to not create a data set with images of corals, but to to have a 3D model that you render, let's say, into a rendering software or something, yeah, and then collect that data set, you know, for your for your style game, yeah, and probably that's that's going to give you a more consistent way uh, data set and uh, more consistent results afterwards, yeah, because I think here this is also the the, the question like what exactly you're trying to learn now yeah? of course when we right now we are just mostly we are just having fun with networks but then later when you start to approach more more precise like uh, 
architectural in a way project then there has to be a clear like why exactly i'm choosing this type of data set and not a different type of data set yeah so why this type of coral and not the other type yeah and right now for example the images that you have right now they have all types of corals yeah and uh, i think that translations are very hard to be created not translation interpolations are very hard to be created then between those types of corals because you don't have for types of corals different or multiple in a way examples yeah you might have one type of coral that is represented by two or three images in your data set you know which then is not really helping that much so in a way try to, to look at this kind of methods of how else can i create the, uh, the uh, corals yeah uh, should i use houdini should i use like grasshopper is there a grasshopper uh, add-on that will create this kind of coral geometries and then I'm just going to render and I'm going to screenshot in a way uh, those corals like that or you know or how how will that be done you know so I think that will really help you also in the direction of controlling you know the output and really controlling also the type of information that the network will learn you know uh, otherwise like this it's quite hard yeah to, to find a lot of images that are very clean and just representing one type or a different type, let's say, of coral. So, yeah, probably you can you can try to look also in that kind of way, you know, if I, if you render them, if you have a 3D and you render it. Yeah, it got, there's, there's um, and coral morphologic of these kind of micro images, really close up images of coral, because coral is quite small, but they get really yeah. close up and that, that can give you much more definition. Otherwise, you just get kind of coral reefs, which are kind of a bit blurred. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah I, I, that was one of the other things I didn't think about when I was looking at all the images. I wanted to get actual like patch reefs to see if they can make like fake patch reefs. But I didn't think about the how the result would come out to it, just simply because I've never done it before. But yeah, just running through it once, like I, I learned not to do it that way. But yeah. And an, another That's fun how. experiment because you were talking about uh, the Pirates of Caribbean. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, so yeah, a, yeah. a fun experiment will actually be, you know, uh, if you have this kind of clean data set of, uh, of corals to have a style again that is looking at on one hand like uh, faces, yeah, and the other hand uh, corals, and that asks you, you know, to create this kind of uh, translations between the composition of the face and the corals, and you might end up with some super interesting, who knows, yeah, maybe. Yeah, Maybe you end up into a, a makeup artist, you know, for movies with, <laughs> with those kind of things. <laughs> yeah, I was actually worried to see how it would come out with the faces, but when I saw the real come out, I was like, wow, that's actually really cool. Yeah, so that could be a cool inspiration, you know, for makeup industry, like a movie makeup industry, you know, so, yeah. Oh, okay, let, let's, let's, let's move on. But, um, thanks, Edgar, you had fun, right? I would, I would go do some micro images now and see if you can... <laughs> Uh, Yulia, are you ready to go? Hello, yes. Let me share real quick. Mm. Um, okay, I'll share the screen because I'm not sure. Okay, so I used style gans and this was the the first I combined it with flowers. This was the data site I used. And um, they kind of like morphed in, the faces morphed into the flowers. And um, the gang actually realized pretty fast where the flowers are and how to create them. And um, so, uh, but my favorite example is when, when I use circle interpolation and um, um, so the flowers look like they were just moving to me. This one with the lower one and this one was. And and um, I try to use different methods too. Like I, I like this one too, but this one was um, Truncation from small to high, and this one was, I think, just with a small truncation or something. But um, then I thought, um, because I was thinking of this idea for my project is um, 
how you can interact with with the city with the visual devices. So I was like, what if I use this system, the already system that I had with flowers and train on top of it, the buildings. And I wanted mostly to see how it's just gonna morph into them. So it still needs, it still needs a lot of work. This like run for like seven hours, but it definitely needs way more because um, this was the last one that I had so far that uh, the buildings are still very squiggly, but then at the same time, when I looked at the um, uh, different Turkish, I kind of liked the idea of how how the building seems like it's moving on the wind and then transforms into like the bigger windows transform into the smaller one. And this one looked like a, a building transformed into like a tablecloth and uh, got something pierced through that. So like things like that, but the, this network definitely needs more training. And then I try to use cycle game, but because uh, those examples that I showed you before, they were like so different from one another. Like for instance, here it had stripes and here's that, that the, they looked, similar in the first lens, but then uh, I couldn't train the cycle again as, as, as well, because what I was trying to do is trying to create shapes and uh, if we can make build into it. So uh, for next, I probably will try to use like similar dat data sets, like for instance, like one building instead of like stripes and squares, something like that. I don't know. Yeah, and that's it. Right. So I think I think the experiments are very interesting, and also the um, the one with the roses. I think it's very interesting with the flowers. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So here, I think usually when I'm making these kind of comments, uh, I'm making comments that also apply to mostly everyone uh, mm -hmm. in the in the class. So here, I think we also have to be very aware of which is the level uh, where the information that we want the network to learn is situated at. Yeah. So for example, if I want to learn like aspects of just fenestration or this kind of windows and stuff like that, then when I'm creating this, this kind of crops, I might I should make sure that the crop is small enough so that it's just capturing those kind of moments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I want to have the network learn something more than just fenestration or windows and stuff like that, then the crop very likely is going to be bigger. Yeah. So I'm just making this comment because in your case, yeah, the results, they are mostly this kind of very small, like very zoomed in in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah? And probably they have to do with the, the crop size, yeah? Uh, so then it's it's a question there, yeah? Is, is this really the information that we wanted to learn or is something else, yeah? So that's a question, but then also it's a sort of observation yeah, of the result. And you're saying, now I understand that if I have this kind of uh, just, uh, crops and zoom ins of the building, mostly the network is just going to learn those aspects. It's not going to learn the overall composition of the building in a certain way. Yeah? So even if I input multiple images, let's say of, of, I have one image that I'm breaking it into smaller crops, the network is not going to be aware of the overall image. Yeah? It's going to be aware of the, just mm -hmm. the crop images yeah? and the semantic information that you have there. Yeah? So in that yeah. kind of sense, then then it's good to um, it's good to to be aware of you know I'm trying to to have the network learn this kind of thing. So I have to be careful when I'm developing the data set so that the crop it's really capturing those things, yeah, because then the output is really going to be uh, uh, describing those kind of things. So the same goes also with the uh, with the uh, uh, roses, for example. It's very interesting, yeah. They are very beautiful, and also the move is very nice. It's this kind of very nice shift, yeah, of uh, the of the petals. But if you want to have like a, a, a more global, in a way, let's say composition of that, you'll have to have the crop bigger, yeah, and then you'll you'll be able to to interpret that kind of uh, 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 not interpret but learn that kind of uh, composition, yeah, that is more zoomed out, yeah. So you can play with those kind of things and then try to see different levels where you can apply them. You know, you're saying that you wanted to use also um, uh, Thalgan, uh, not Thalgan, Cyclegan. So imagine that right now you have this one, you have this output that is quite zoomed in, yeah? 
So it's just giving you some kind of composition online, like traction outreach and so on. Yeah. But you can make an argument that actually this is intentional. Like what I want to do is I want to look at these kind of buildings that have this kind of facades with these kind of patterns. And I want to just extract, in a way, compositional, in a way, patterns from those facades. Yeah. And then I'm going to generate, let's say, with that network, some compositional uh, like rules and lines. And then on those ones, I'm going to apply these kind of rules that I have in titles, let's say. Yeah. And then I'm going to have a cycle again that looks at petals and looks at, you know, flowers and uh, and this kind of more abstract compositional rules and create a very nice composition now yeah? so you can in a way try to combine this and try to think in a way at this kind of levels of design yeah? and try to understand where i'm applying specifically the network yeah i understand that right now you know there are many use uh, many people are using ai like or this kind of networks you just look at the entire building it's great yeah you look at the entire building and then the network is outputting a completely new, this building doesn't exist kind of result, yeah? Um, but um, if you if you wanna use this kind of uh, AI, let's say in the creative process where AI, it's not necessarily just uh, creating design for us, but it's in a way helping us, engaging with us in this kind of uh, creative process of design, yeah? Then we, we have to look at, you know, which are the, the strengths of this kind of networks and where they can help us in this kind of process, yeah? I want, I, I want to learn composition, let's say, from nature. So I'm going to have a network that's looking at a certain scale in nature and it's going to learn that composition. And then I'm going to look at buildings and I'm going to ask another network to translate the buildings to their composition from nature, for example, yeah? And then suddenly we end up with a super interesting creative process and we end up with something that's completely novel, yeah? That normally as designer will not, in a way, come up with something like that, yeah? So, I mean, I'm just speculating here, like well, ways how you can look at, at this, yeah. But overall, I think again, it's uh, it's really really interesting. Yeah, I agree. I try to do something with like a buildings like this, and then a cut it pattern, and I actually kind of like the pattern at the end. But um, would you think what you mentioned the uh, how organic would like translate into would we have like the patterns? From nature translate into urban like would you suggest to do it in cycle again more than yeah something like that cycle again yeah uh -huh. okay something like that cycle again because what i want to have is i want to be able to to give patterns from nature and i want to have a network that gives me interpretations uh from building domain let's say gives me interpretation on that kind of composition from nature you know so uh, in that way, yeah, you can do that with a uh, uh, cycle again. Yeah? You cannot do it with a style again. Okay. So we, we really have to understand that. Um, I don't know how many of you, um, okay, there are different types of of creativity. Yeah? And especially when it comes to networks, most of the networks, they do interpolation type of uh, creativity. Yeah? So you have your data set and then the network learns the data set and then creates interpolations. Yeah. Uh, so uh, whatever creativity is that, it's still creativity in a way, you can say, because uh, you have, let's say, two ends here, and the network is figuring out how to create the middle. Yeah, That's still a creative output, let's say. But um, if you want to go outside of that domain that you're defining with your data set, um, for example, a style GAN will not do that, Yeah, but a, um, but a um, cycle GAN will be able to do that. Yeah. And for me, that's that's why I'm still considering uh, cycle again to be more interesting than than um, style again. Of course, style again has this kind of very strong, in a way, interpolations, and they are very catchy. But personally, from I consider personally from a, a creativity perspective, I think uh, cycle again it's uh, it's more powerful, and the concept is more elegant behind uh, behind the cycle again. All right. Thank you. Thank you. But, but yeah, I think you, you got some stuff for material for your for Valentine's Day there with those, for those roses. That was great. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, Emmanuel, can't see him here. Um, uh, I know that Mita can't make it, and Philip, his computer crashed. Um, uh, but we do have at least one uh, DDES student, uh, a candidate, um, Theodorus. Who else wants to present? Uh, Marina, do you want to do you want to present or?
Yeah, I mean, I'll be, I'll be very curious. I mean, if uh, DDAS is not uh, showing anything, but I will be curious in a way, what's the opinion of the DDAS uh, candidates yeah, um, of the work? Well, I got some very positive comments on the, on the, the WhatsApp. So, uh, um, uh, yeah. Um, no, they, fantastic presentations from Eleanor. <laughs> stuff from Russia. Russia. No, no, I think it's it's great stuff, and I'm glad you guys have been throwing yourself into it. Um, uh, also, uh, Matthias who had to go. He said he said congratulations. Well, it's not me. It's, I said it's Daniel did this. Um, Theodorus, are you are you here at the moment? Um, and yeah, you, I'm here. You want to go show us your uh, crazy? Mm, okay, I can show some. Yeah, I don't have as much actually as what was shown, but I can show. Uh, so one second. Uh, so can you see my screen right let me let me take away this okay cannot reach the phone i'm actually just still so doing stuff just just a second so we all saw the first um image there was a research paper yeah so oh, yeah so I, I used to i used to say to everyone that if you really want to learn something, yes, one way is to really just, you know, um, um, go and ha take a lot of uh, workshops and tutorials and stuff like that. But if you really want to learn something, you have to jump into uh, research papers and try to, to learn in that kind of way. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. the, that's the best way to actually grow. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what I've been using is StyleGun. Uh, it's, a, it's a new version of StyleGun called the uh, ADA. And a few, uh, a few days ago, the PyTorch version of that came out. So I prefer that, 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 that approach. And what ADA does is very good at low data regimes, which is where I usually operate. I never have a lot of data. Uh, and I actually trained it on a data set I created this train valid doesn't matter for this, but anyways, I created like a, a few years ago, like, I don't know if I can see. So it's like a data set of about 18, let me, let me put it. Yeah, 18 different architectural offices. And inside is just, you know, Google images of their projects or stuff like that, right? It's not like quality controlled or anything, like maybe some of these buildings, you know, don't exist or they're not theirs. Uh, this is Albert. Alberts and Van Hoot. Um, some of them are a bit wonky on purpose. I wanted to have like different different stuff, like Goody Clancy. I don't know if anyone knows. Uh, so this is the data set. It's about 3,000 images. And I think for these models, it's not, it's not really a lot. And then I, I trained. I didn't use any pre-trained models, although there are a lot available. So like Faces and Sci-Fi and all this stuff. And I thought it wouldn't help, but people have told me since then that even the, the faces data set, which is really pre-trained for a lot uh, from the official repo, helps for anything. So it can help for buildings or roads. So that's where, and then I trained it. I've trained it for about 1 20th of the official training uh, guidelines or something like that. So 1 20th of the time, because my GPU just doesn't, can't handle so much, let's say. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to show just a few results. Like it's it's not nothing really crazy. So it's all about building. So what I've been trying to do. So maybe I show the grids first. Like what I, what maybe is interesting. Uh, sorry, I've been trying to do is just gener generate building stuff. And this is like a sort of evolution. I hope this goes by time. So let let's put by day modifier. Yeah. So I started creating this is the style mixing stuff. I don't know if anyone can see this. I can zoom in later. So what this does is it takes five, five different latents here and five latents. So this, this, this edge and top are five generated designs from StyleGun. Uh, I do not believe they exist because you can see they have like some weird designs. And then the, the algorithm just mixes between them, right? And, and this was the first the first grid I created, uh, the first, and I think it's it it looks quite nice. So you can see here, you know, this building and this building, their mix is like very, you know, towards grayish. And then, you know, here it creates this glass facade. 
and from this like very weird building and what i like and, I, and i've seen this in a few models i'm not sure if this is true this is just a small intuition is that usually the more styles you mix the more kind of latin latin expressions you mix the quality improves i've seen this in a different model uh, where they were actually mixing embeddings and every time they mix the new embedding they would improve the quality of the outputs. I wonder if this happens here. Here it doesn't, so maybe it's, it's a mistake. So here you can see it takes this texture and it applies it here, very nice, I think. And I, this is my favorite, I think. A sort of like older school facade and it applied, applies it here. The same with the other designs. It has some stuff that are a bit more sketchy and actually look like sketches like this. It looks like a park somehow, I don't know. So it's not all perfect, obviously. Uh, because I should say for me, I'm not, I'm not so much interested in something like this, something more like, uh, you know, creative or generative. I'm really interested in creating real buildings somehow. I don't think I will do with StyleGun, but with generative models somehow. Uh, so this is one approach. And then the more I, was, I will train it, I think the better results I will get. So here again, you can see how this picture maybe is the most striking. It kind of changes. Yeah, into different areas. I have some cherry pick grids uh, to show. Uh, this is not very good grid. I don't like it. But there was one grid that was nice. Okay, then I did 10 by 10, which was not the best idea. Uh, but you can see how it, again, like, you know, it changes the style. It takes, this. it does very good in this style, I think, in the, in the brown sort of uh, old school facade. Yeah. And, you can see how it captures like greenery and landscape. I think it's very good for the amount of training because again, this was trained in a lot more iterations. This is like the latest one. I should I should be I should be scrolling actually. That was a mistake. Yeah, this is the latest one. Like somehow these latters were not very nice. This building is not very nice. It looks like a face. But what I like is how it transfers the the landscape because the original picture does have some landscape, but it can't like feels like vegetation with everything. So it does very well. And then the other thing I will show and I will stop again. I don't have a presentation, I'm sorry, because this is like happening in real time right now. Uh, is a bit of the projection. So I the, one of the projection I did is I took this picture of the U Garden, which is very, very difficult, I think, for the model. This is from, OK. <laughs> My goodness, this, okay, this is from uh, Shanghai. Uh, there is nothing like this inside, right? This is completely odd. And the projection, what it does, it tries to kind of like take this image, it passes it through the model, and then it tells the model, okay, uh, just mix this random thing that you created towards this image, you know, just project it towards this image. And I think it's a sort of a variable evolution they do. And this is the latest one. So you see, it starts from a random building and then it, it tries to push, let's say, the vector, essentially what this is, towards the left, right? And what I like about this is not only that it starts to capture the redness of the facade here and even the structure, but it's the, the, the reflections. I think the reflections are incredible uh, that it creates it. I've seen something like this before in Big Gun. So in Big Gun, I've seen images where it creates reflections, but the reflections are totally wrong. So it's like a person and the reflection is like a boat, I don't know. But here it's actually trying to create the reflection of this building, which really blows my mind, I think. So this is like one projection. And then because we talked about corals and I'm almost done, I did a projection of corals. Did I delete it? Uh, I think this is the one. So this is like a weird coral, and again, these are not very serious tests because it's very hard to create something like this on the left. Like it's not even a building. And I think this is the, the, la the latest one I did. And at the end it manages to capture the whole circle. If it doesn't, it's the early one. Yeah, you can see how much harder it is. No, it, it's not this one. I had another one that I was showing like as the training was going anyways, it was better. And you know, I, then I did maybe like some foster apartment. The other one is like the tulip building. I think this was in Miami. I'm not sure it ever got built. I just found it online. And then again, you're trying to push the Latin to appear like this building. And it does very well. And I, what I like about this is that it doesn't really care about this building only, even though I do. It gets, I think, the background as well. So it tries to create a bit of the background. Again, it's not a design. This is one of the, the issues I have with all this. Like, this is a nice, 
you know, sort of capture, you know, abstract capture of this, but how do we move to design? And I think, I think that's that. I mean, I have a few other of these videos to show, but it's not very, very interesting. Like this is how it, the, the three different iterations. So like this was very early on in the left, a bit more training in the middle, a bit more in the right. Somehow the reflections in the left are better, but they don't reflect what is actually above. While here it's starting to reflect the, the shape above. So yeah, this is what I've been doing. Just Eilgen so far. And I have some Forster in part, but it's not so interesting. I think I will, I will, I will stop the share here. Yeah, yeah but, but these, yeah, these are interesting. These are very interesting uh, like explorations either way. I understand that right now you're just uh, started training and I uh, started to look into that, but I think it's super interesting uh, just to address in a way like this kind of uh, what you're saying, you know, about projection, yeah, you, we are projecting it and then you're saying that we don't really know if that's really creative. I think where we get to creative, it's maybe in the part where you have the, the grid interpolations, yeah. And right now, I think that that works mostly just at the stylistic level. I think you're just uh, addressing or probably the way you have it set it up is just uh, there is a level of resolution that's going to be uh, to affect. If you are looking at those uh, at the Latins, the columns and the rows, you'll see that always the rows, uh, you're just taking almost like the texture and the color and applying it on the columns, yeah? But you're not really uh, doing this kind of like, um, like composition, let's yeah. say like low level. Like if you if you were to, to access, let's say, 32 by 32 with 64 uh, layers or levels. And, though, at, and at that level to create the translation, you'll end up with a building that is, let's say a bar and the column, let's say it's a, it's a tower. And then you end up with this kind of interesting morph between those two, yeah? And I think that's where we, we actually start to, to be creative. And I think this is the cool part about this kind of networks and in special uh, style again, because it's able to disentangle that well, the features. Um, is if you you can literally say you know like I want only these features to be applied to this column yeah and then you have those features translated onto the column yeah right now I think what you have is mostly uh, just stylistic like you know yeah. you're saying color and maybe high uh, resolution or high level you know information but not so much the composition I think once you start to jump into the composition of it I think that's where things start to be very, very interesting, yeah? Yeah, it's this kind of like This kind of I arithmetics, you know, arithmetics yeah. between life latents, you know? I haven't seen that anywhere in StyleGen yet. I did find something about where they edit specific parts of an image with StyleGen, but the closest to what you're discussing, I saw it in Dali, which is not open yet. That's where they really compose stuff, so, so I'm really excited about that. You uh, have to look yeah. into StyleGen 1. If you look at StyleGen 1, you'll see that oh, there right. are some yeah, StyleGen 1 has uh, a few examples uh, of style mixing, yeah? And the style mixing there, and I think if you even go on uh, NVIDIA, like Lab, on their GitHub, the original one, they have a style mixing uh, method. And that one, it's beyond, it's beyond just, you know, like uh, this kind of high, high resolution you know, information. Mm. Uh, you can okay. also access the, the low level. So I will think, check that out. That's, that's super, super nice. But either way, I mean, also those projections are very, very interesting. And I think, you know, um, that's, that's the, the interesting thing here. And for us, for example, Coupion Blau, uh, the Deepion Blau project that I'm uh, developing, it's, um, uh, it's not necessarily a style GAN or cycle GAN. It's like a sort of combination, like it's uh, borrowing ideas from one, from the other, you know, multiple kind of methods and they are combined and they create this deep human blau network but there is the same thing is like you know we we out we create a data set let's say with images from copium blau but the end goal is not to have a network to output images that look exactly like copium blau you know like our buildings our, our past buildings yeah that's not the idea because then it's like we don't really need the software to to just interpolate between our own buildings you know if we want to have an AI, we want to have an AI that learns our style, and then it's able to somehow create new new images. Yeah. So um, then also here, like the data set that you start to put together, it's like, how do I put that data set together yeah? in order to end up with results that are very, you know, a novel. They are not just uh, so that the network is not only outputting for me 
the exact images that I have in the data set, you know, because that's not really that interesting. It's interesting as a learning exercise, but not for us from a creative perspective, you know. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's where, you know, these are the challenges there. You have like the data set, how, how you have the network then learning correctly so that it's not just learning the, the data set itself, yeah, but it's also able to create something completely new and then how we control that kind of uh, output, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, all that work, it's amazing. And yeah, by the way, I'm also a fan of PyTorch. I'm also writing in PyTorch. I don't like TensorFlow. Yeah. But there yeah. is. A, I saw an advantage of TensorFlow that people I've seen in the community they use like you can apply for the TPUs. Mm -hmm. And I think because of, because you're also like you know a researcher, you could. But I cannot work with them. And I applied, and they haven't responded. So maybe that's just a dream. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I thought it's much better. Yeah. That was that was good. Yeah. Um, we, we've got, I think, just are we just Marina? Is you want to present yours? Is there anyone else want to present? Okay, let's. Uh, I mean, just yeah, Marina, go ahead. Okay, I'm going. Hello. Um, Okay, so uh, my presentation is going to be a little bit more sensible, <laughs> but uh, um, it's the first time I'm using this, so I hope uh, I, I learn a lot anyway. Um, but the name of my experiment is Nullisms, and uh, what I am, just a second, okay. So what I'm going to try to do at least is to try to make my presentation a cycle again. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's going to be a cycle, not cycle again, but a cycle at least. Uh, so my um, first intuition um, was uh, try to work with something which is related with my actual research uh, for the thesis. Um, so when I started my, my research, I started to look at for these maps uh, which are in a way architectural maps. They are trying to map uh, tendencies in architecture. Maybe the first one, which is a Piranesi map, is more uh, plans, architectural plans. But it, you have like this kind of uh, segments, but at the same time you have like uh, things which are like um, mixed or try to go together and then try to separate. I'm explaining all this because it's in a way it's part of um, some logics that I was trying to use. And uh, the mm -hmm. map in the middle is uh, Charles Schenck's um, mm -hmm. diagram, which is more evolutionary. You have like a line of time and then you have like different tendencies. And inside this, all these texts are um, uh, architectural office or architects. And then you have this timeline and uh, it's like a kind of evolution. And in the, this is mm -hmm. the second map of Schenck's, but <laughs> he had another before. Uh, and then you have like the um, Saira Polo uh, diagram with uh, Guillermo Fernandez Abascal, which is a global architecture political compass, which is like try to cut in a synchronic way the Shanks map, but um, uh, with architectural practices, their office as well. And then you have like uh, different, um, uh, try, uh, different tendencies and they are like more uh, political into the center. And then, okay, it has like a, a, a different logic. But in a way, what I was um, uh, studying and this, I'm doing all this to explain where my data come from is, uh, which is biases of, of course, at, at least until now, it's super biases. But it's this idea of the megalomaniac uh, frustrated architect, which is an architect that cannot build so it tried to occupy everything with uh, the architecture that uh, uh, he couldn't uh, build. So they are their designs. So you have like uh, the first map is a uh, knowledge map, which is more a cartographical study of um, Rome with uh, the public spaces. And uh, the second one is a Piranesi uh, map. Um, and where I go with this on my, uh, at least I'm trying to make an image of my thoughts, but in a way when I, what I studied there is like, uh, this is a, a competition, Roma Interrota in 1978. And then you have like each square is an architect 
who designed, and you have a uh, Saltogo, Dardi, Gumbrach, uh, James Stirling, Portoghesi, uh, Shugola, Venturi, in the order that I'm reading from the top to the down and from left to right, no? like a book, <laughs> like an Occidental book. Um, Venturi, Rowe, Graves, uh, Creer Brothers, and Rossi. Uh, so uh, I, I'm going to focus on the steel link um, because what he did is to put his own building that he didn't build in this map and try to, uh, it's like a kind of collage technique, but in a way you can see uh, in the uh, uh, two um, squares on the, on the left and on the right that you have like um, how he works, what is the, the logic. So this is the Derby building and it's like trying to recompose in a way the, the, the block and but uh, it also has like a kind of a new highway and uh, public space is absolutely different uh, uh, to the to the knowledge plan because it's this uh, this is using the knowledge plan that's why. So let's go to the dark part of the presentation, which is my experiment. Uh, and then I call it nullism because I'm, uh, the data is that, is the uh, knowledge map. And um, this is what I did. I start to make some, I mean, I, I try a lot. I, I try with different trainings and things. And uh, one thing that I notice is, first of all, that I need to manipulate data before to, to, to start training. So one thing that I did, I, I inverted because uh, um, it will be easier to the machine to recognize with the other that data set that I, that I use that is uh, La Plata. I'm from La Plata, this is the city where I live and where I born. And uh, so La Plata is a regular city and you have like these uh, diagonals, uh, which uh, makes like uh, cut the, the, the blocks and it generates like differences. And you also have like, um, uh, difference with the blocks that going to the center, to the center edge, you have like the blocks are going smaller and uh, near to the borders is going bigger. So um, what I have to study first is what to cut. What is going to be the, the scale that, is, uh, what is going to be inside the, the, the picture and what I'm going to le uh, let uh, outside uh, first. The other thing that I start to study is like uh, what I was saying about the knowledge uh, and the upper part are the real ones and the down part are the fake ones. So what I notice is that because of the image, the image is not a satellite image. It's a, an image taken from the flight. It's an old image of La Plata. Uh, and wh what I notice is like, the, for example, the roofs are more white. So inverting the situation because the knowledge uh, you have the solid, uh, which is like um, one color, and then you have the street, for example, and open spaces and empty spaces, which are um, in real is the opposite. No, is white and black, and here is white, uh, black and white. So what I did is try to understand this: that I need to make the pair more compatible, so the machine is going to learn easier how to. Uh, identify the, the pixels and the borders. Because what I noticed too, when I started to play with Barcelona and uh, the grasshopper um, images, is that the, the boundaries are like really precise. Even the color, because of the color of Barcelona, uh, it's like super identifiable. Where, where, where is the solid and where is the empty space? Here is not. So it's a little bit tricky. So I try to manipulate that and um, I also uh, discovered, for example, uh, some, some interesting thing that how the, um, the image of La Plata in the knowledge plant start to, to, to cut like this uh, little, like a kind of porosity on the, on the block. So that could be interesting to, for me. And there is the and the right one is like the unexpected outcome in a way. So the third one was more what I was uh, looking for, what I was imagining, and uh, and in the right is like something unexpected that I try. I start to um, to pay attention to it because it's like um, more. 
it led me to speculate more in a way to new kind of uh, geometries which are not regular. So I started with a regular geometry and because the knowledge sometimes has like, when I cut the image, it has like this um, irregular shape. It started to, to, to translate this uh, to, uh, to geometries. Uh, but it was uh, really interesting also because the knowledge plant, in this case, what you have in, in this dark part, uh, for example, is like they are like um, um, empty spaces, but it has like a graphism, it has like a drawing. So because it has a, like a drawing, the, when uh, I translate, uh, when the machine translated the, um, the image of La Plata, it uh, filled it with density which was one of my first objectives. Try to think how, try to, uh, in a way, give to the Noli plant more dense uh, density that they have in La Plata to put it there and to see what is happening and to see how this can be, can, can have like more, um, yeah, porosity and differences. And uh, this is, this was uh, really interesting too, because, um, and this is all different uh, uh, um, epochs. I made like 70, I didn't have more time to do more, but I would like to continue. And uh, what I started to do also is to manipulate the data and to replace uh, data. And uh, for example, I start to distort La Plata's grid to make it more compatible with the knowledge plan to make better this translation from one to the other. And then to have like different kind of images, images which are more compatible and images where, which are not. And to see, and uh, start to test what was working and what was like pure noise and I couldn't like identify anything. But uh, the results were uh, started to be even um, better because I start to see that I have like these paired images uh, it was like more, uh, less um, obvious, which was with the relation between the images. And um, so I, I played with the rotation, I played with the crop, with the image, with the scale also, and um, I, I, with the with different distortions to, to, the, to that grid. And um, so trying to make this cycle that I was saying, what I was thinking about this, because you have a lot of time to think when the machine is training <laughs> and you are testing things and you have a lot of time to think. And I was a th what I was thinking is like, in a way which is related with this idea of diagram uh, that I, I showed before, which is part of my, my thesis, is that it's not absolute. I mean, it depends that the, the image is not necessarily two dimensional. Because in a way we see everything like in a kind of uh, Euclidean way. So we believe that uh, is bidimensional because you have y and z, uh, y and x to say something, a unit set, for example. So we need we always think like it's like it has to be three dimensional, like um, a volume. But it does. But it's not necessarily true because when you manipulate data, for example, and you see in this case the Nolly plan, which is like <laughs> super old map. It has like a multi-dimensional level because you have names, for example, or you have this graphism for the farmers' places, and then you have like the solids, and then you have another graphism for the water. So this is all different layers of information. So when we see that, we understand that it's not bidimensional. Uh, it's it's multi-dimensional. It's in, in in an informational way. So I, I believe that if we can manipulate this. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't have to be necessary three dimensional to think one space because they are like, um, uh, yeah, multiple, uh, multiple uh, conception about what a, what a space is. Today we perceive everything like, I don't know, in a perspective way. So we believe that it, uh, we, have, we are like training to see in that way. <laughs> But uh, I believe that one thing that we can understand about these diagrams is that uh, they have like several dimensionals that are not bidimensional. So I don't believe that this is something to criticize to, to these uh, processes. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you. I think it's great that um, that you go so granular in a way to try to, to look at all those uh, factors that might affect and might influence, uh, you know, the data set and the network and so on. And I think in a way that's that's a good approach in a way. If you really want to have a network that really learns things correctly, yeah, there's there's going to be a lot of effort that needs to be put into uh, understanding the data set, understanding in a way what kind of uh, information, how the network will work, how, you know, conceptually, how you think about the data set versus uh, the network way of learning, you know. I think those those aspects are going to be extremely crucial, yeah. Uh, so, of course, right now we are looking at it from an analog perspective. Probably there are other methods that we can deploy that, that are more digital that will help us in a way to really uh, analyze correctly this data. Um, so, uh, but but that's that's a, a different kind of discussion. But I think it's very interesting. Yeah. So for me, it will be also interesting. Like, to is there a way for us to uh, in a knowledge map? Is it uh, is it a way for us to really uh, extract all those layers that you were mentioning just uh, just a few minutes ago? Yeah, you were talking about different layers that are encoded in that map. Uh, so that will be in a way things probably the network learns by itself. Yeah, like just by looking at it and without even uh, understanding that what that layer is. It's just going to understand that it's a, a sort of pattern up next yeah, to another course. pattern of pixels, yeah? yeah. Um, but yeah, for us, for sure, if we want to like uh, have the network be aware of those kind of types of layers that we have, probably we have to segment things and then as the network look at them separately like that, yeah? Almost like to already know that there is a differentiation, uh, there is a distinction between the, the Different types, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I, I think it's great. Yeah, I, I think it's great, and uh, probably uh, many of the master students can look also at the way you approach the data set and maybe learn something from there. Yeah, in, in the sense of you really have to like understand. Okay, the network it's working this kind of way. So my data set that has to be like this. Yeah. So you're saying you know one data set I have the rooftops that are more white and uh, the streets are more dark and so. Maybe I have to flip it just to make sure that the network understands correctly what I'm trying to describe here, you know? So I think all those things are super great points, yeah, that uh, I really, let's say, congrats, you know, on picking on those kind of small details, you know? Yeah, just to thanks, be, I, thanks. I could add something. I mean, I think it was great, great work, Marina, fantastic. And I, I really, I also appreciate the kind of the flipping and so on. One thing that really struck me though, and I, maybe, I don't know, I, I Daniel maybe can 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 comment on this more. I, I when I was uh, visiting Refik's office once, he was showing me when these kind of the clustering you get when you when you go through style gans, and he he had a whole range of different architects. You know, was, there was Zaha, there was Toyito, there was I don't know Foster or something like that. You know, Gary and so on. And actually, automatically, the system kind of clustered them and separated them. You know, they're, they're obviously buildings rather than architects and things, but there was a process and operation in that thing. And I, so that was one thing. I just wonder, I don't know, this is a common really for, question really for Daniel, whether uh, whether whether that clustering could be kind of compared to that Charles Jenks or, or Alejandro Zarapolo model in any way. Maybe not, maybe not. But I also thought the kind of the, the morphing that happens when you, when you do, do you take a kind of trajectory through one of those clusters, um, is kind of similar to the flow thing. So there are lots of kind of parallels and I'm not quite sure what it is, but there's something really potentially very interesting there. I, I, Daniel, is, is that, how do the clusters work exactly? So um, very likely what you're referring to, you're referring to UMAPs or uh, self pronounced maps or K-mean clusterings or Disney, which are like types of uh, machine learning, let's say algorithm. I mean, self organized map is not really a uh, machine learning, it's mostly a neural network already. So uh, it, there are these kind of algorithms, yeah, that try to cluster and mostly they are based on dimensionality reduction, most of them. So dimensionality reduction, what it does, uh, you look at uh, n-dimensional data. In our case, for example, a latent space, yeah, it's uh, n-dimensional space, yeah. And uh, for us as humans, even three dimensions is very hard to comprehend many times. So then the idea is how can you can you uh, map in a way the latent space so that we as humans are able to comprehend it, yeah? So then what you're doing is you're lo looking at, you're using this kind of autoencoders they are called, yeah? So uh, you're trying in a way to, uh, to map the input to the output. You're trying to have a network that tries to learn in a way 
input and output. So what the process, what's going to happen there, you have uh, a lot of layers on the, as the input, and then you have just two layers, let's say in the middle of the network, and then you have uh, the same number of input layers uh, as output, yeah? So like that, the network is trying to compress in a way the information and then expand it back, yeah? So it's almost like this kind of process of, I'm reading a book, and then uh, you are asking me to tell you which is uh, the topic of the book. So I'll have to compress somehow all that knowledge that I read and I have to compress it in one phrase, for example, yeah? But that phrase has to represent in a way the, the, uh, the book that I just read, yeah? So it's this kind of compression yeah, that's happening. So then dimensionality reduction happens in the same way. You, uh, you have a network that reads the entire space but then it should be able to uh, to give almost like a summary that it's able to give us you know an understanding of what the entire space is about yeah and then it's creating this kind of 2d map yeah in a way two dimensional map that has also this kind of location in a way a uh, rule where more similar uh, similar uh, versions are placed closer to each other the similar ones are further apart yeah and this is for example self organized map or also uv map i think it's uh, uh, not UV, uh, UMAP, it's working similar way. Um, the other one came in clusterings at, at Disney, they, they have a different kind of idea behind, but uh, but that's uh, overall, that's the idea, yeah, dimensionality reduction. You're trying to to bring the, the n-dimensional space to a 2D so that you as a human can look at it and understand it, yeah? And those cl those clusters, you know, they just emerge because in the, in the end, uh, the information that you give, like different styles of architecture or different architects, uh, even if they are images, yeah, the content in a way is described in a certain way, yeah. So they are more similar to each other, yeah. And for example, if you even if you were to use uh, uh, VV, uh, VGG or how they are called networks, perceptual similarity networks, where in a way um, you have networks that are looking at two two images, and even if one image is blurry and the other one is sharp, it's still going to be able to tell that they are the same image, for example, yeah. Well, because perceptually, it's able to understand, yeah. So in, this, in a very similar uh, manner, yeah, you can create then this kind of clustering and you know, uh, sorting of, of the latent space. Interesting. No, I saw, but, yeah, it's, it's really based on this kind of idea. That's the easiest way I can explain yeah, it. It's like, I, mean, so I, have, I have a great, uh, I'm reading a great book and personally I have to somehow compress in, encode in a way that information. And right. then, you know, just say it into one se sentence or two sentences. Well, well, but that's precisely what's happening in, with the Charles Jenks map in some, in, in a different way. You know, there is a kind of a compression of information into simplistic terms. So, I mean, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a, it's a thought exercise that you, know, you, should, you should take with you and think about whether that's going to be relevant or not. But uh, it just struck me as being an interesting kind of comparison in a way. Um, and uh, completely reductivist in some ways, but... Um, Daniel, one thing just before we wrap up, I think we're towards the end. Here, but do you want to kind of post something about your your um, uh, your your clubhouse discussion tomorrow? Uh, uh, yeah, so tomorrow, so tomorrow I'm just trying to to run a, a clubhouse, you know, a discussion. It's going to be just a chat. Yeah, it's not going to be something like you know specific topic or something, but it's just a way maybe to you know to bring together multiple people that deal with. Uh, AI, perhaps computation, AI, just, you know, just a common discussion. I don't know how many of you already uh, have the um, uh, Clubhouse love, app. I love to come. Amazing. So I just posted uh, the, the event on the, uh, on the chat. So maybe you can go through to uh, Clubhouse, like if you install the app, you'll see what you have. You have the wall, yeah. Usually in Facebook, yeah, you have the wall, but here it's considered the hallway. And then you have different rooms, yeah, that you can access, yeah. And those rooms usually like you go from this kind of top of the industry kind of people to like just normal people like us, yeah. Uh, but you have this kind of like you know uh, Silicon Valley in a way, uh, uh, venture capitalist in a way in some rooms talking about uh, startup, others talking about you know other topics, yeah. It's just just amazing, yeah, it's a, a sort of like um, audio social media, let's say, yeah. Can you invite and, us maybe, or how do we, is it invite? Yes, so, um, so I can invite, I think I invited Neil, and then Neil gets automatically another invite, yeah. And uh -huh, then okay. the other invite is able to invite somebody else and so on, yeah. Could, so okay. do, do I, 
do I have to, um, can I just paste, can I just say share it on WhatsApp, the same invite, or, or it has to be specific to me? Um, I think it's uh, specific to you, and then you have to make it specific to others and like that in a way you propagate, yeah. Okay. So right now, uh, it's, I think it has three months or four months, the, the, um, the, me the social media, the cloud house, yeah. I wonder if you if you you could you could send one to to Theodorus. He could because I'm going to be so busy putting together my thing. Okay, to so Theodorus, for for something like that to happen, I will need your phone number. I have phone to, number, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So if you if you send me a, a, a email with your phone number or message with your phone number, then I can add you to my phone book and like that I can invite you. Okay. Okay. What will be amazing? I mean, it will be amazing, you know, to have a chat. You'll you'll see it's very interesting, like experience. I think it's, it's more interesting than, you know, visual, like, uh, because it's almost like you're talking on the phone and you have the chance to listen in to somebody talking on the phone, you know, because uh, you have this kind of uh, idea of, you know, um, there are a few people that are invited on the scene, on, uh, yeah, on the scene, and then the other ones, they are just auditing in a way, yeah? So only the people that are on the scene, only those who are able to speak actually, yeah? And the rest they can all, uh, almost like uh, just listen, yeah? But it's very interesting because it's almost like a phone call, yeah? It's just that you are able to tap in into that phone call and you listen in a way, super interesting discussions in the end. But that was, I mean, have you invited Elon Musk to this? Yes, exactly. That was also <laughs> Elon Musk, yeah, he was there too. I mean, Neil, then you, you know the experience, yeah, how, yeah. how Clubhouse no, it was, is. It was mind-blowing. I think I was on a live stream from it, though, rather than the yeah. thing itself. But, but it yeah, was... I, I was trying to get into the room, and I was before it even started, and it was already full. Like, it was just insane with Elon Musk, yeah. But it was, think, it was just, it made the national, international news. It was just yeah. an incredible thing. And, and I must say, I, you know, Elon Musk came up with some interesting kind of, the most interesting, I don't know what it is, but he kind of was very forthcoming with ideas and comments. And it was just fascinating. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's, it's almost like you just, just hear his train of thoughts. It's, it's not like, you know, this kind of filtering, like this is an interview and this is that and that. It's just train of thought, just casual discussion. And I think it's just amazing. Yeah. So, okay. Um, uh, uh, just to, to say again, so at nine o'clock tomorrow, uh, East, so Eastern Standard Time, there's a, um, a theory AI workshop um, uh, that, that, that I'm, well, it works, sorry, it's a, a panel discussion, shall we say, that I'm kind of hosting and, um, uh, for the DDES uh, thing. And I think that's going to be super interesting. And Matthias and then hopefully Daniel and a few others will be there. So you're most welcome to kind of follow on to that one. Um, I'll, I'll send you the link. Um, and uh, so there's a lot happening, a lot happening. Um, Daniel, I just want to finish by thanking you so much for this. This has been incredible. I, you know, I actually, I'm not the one to be thanking you, it's the students, because I, you know, I think you've inspired them. Um, they have, I, I was, I'm always worried when, when um, they get, they bring introducing anyone to some new technologies and techniques and things, but the enthusiasm which they grasped it and the excitement, I think, you know, um, anyway, I can't speak for them. They can maybe speak to you, for that. but uh, thank you so much because it was, you know, I think it's you've really opened up some new, um, new territories of exploration. And uh, I think I, I, I got the sense everybody really enjoyed this, this, this exercise, um, but I'll let them say something. Um, yes, I, thank I, you so I, very much, Daniel. I, I, we, we learned a lot through these workshops and the way you explain the concepts. Uh, uh, I think it gets through to a lot of people, which is why everybody gets to be so excited about it. Amazing to hear that. I mean, I, I'm always trying. Nicole, Nicole, he was in my in my uh, FIU class when I was uh, a visiting professor at FIU. So also there, I was tr always trying to um, to keep in a way the jargon down in a way, not to not to be too overwhelming because even like this, like the entire technology itself is very overwhelming. So then I'm always trying to explain things like with very, very common language and, you know, uh, very simple concepts. So everyone can get it, you know. Yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. Um, so there's there's an ongoing series. I'm feeling like I'm bombarded by kind of these Zoom events and, and whatever. Um, uh, uh, clubhouse events now. The, the next week, at all, just remind again, just remind you that on Saturday we've got 
well, tomorrow we can talk about the theory of AI and creativity. And on Saturday on Digital Futures, we have uh, Refik Allen and a few other people doing something on showing their work about AI and creativity. The following day uh, on neuroscience and AI. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that Refik and, and Anil Seth will be there um, both for that discussion, but certainly there'll be an amazing discussion there. So it's a kind of ongoing debate. And, you know, I think also these things are being, being shared out there. Um, so anyone who's kind of following it on the live stream, um, please back, you, join us again. Um, and and what, I, what I love about this is the fact that we're straddling all over the, all over the world. There are people in China who are listening and uh, Anna in Australia and so on. And uh, it's kind of showing this, this, this information in a fantastic way. Uh, finally, I'd say this morning, there was the most extraordinary session of um, Digital Futures with some young people um, who were, uh, it was about interactive design, but really it was about reinventing what architecture is about as a discipline. There were people who were just completely kind of caught up in a kind of wave of new invention. Um, uh, who were just redefining what it is that we, can, we as architects can do. And I, I just would uh, uh, recommend you have a look at that. It was, uh, it was mind blowing for me anyway. I don't know about everyone else, but uh, so thank you, Daniel. Um, and thank you to the team who's been live streaming it to G and Jenan and, and, uh, and Yu Yang. Um, thank you so much um, and to be continued. Um, so uh, please come and join uh, Daniel on Clubhouse tomorrow. We'll find a way of trying to spread the, spread the information and um, also to, uh, tomorrow, well, I say morning, but it could be evening for wherever you are. Um, the, tonight, for some people in, uh, in China, um, the, the event on, on AI and creativity, that, uh, the theory event. So um, thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Excuse me, excuse me, Neil. I posted the information for your uh, for your talk in the chat. Okay. Thank, thank you, Daniel. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Gustav. Gustav, I'd say is we have some of the Digital Futures team here with us, and they were responsible for the setting up the session this morning. Uh, I know that Virginia's here, and and Gustavo, you're doing a fantastic job. I think people, are, they always thank me, and I, they shouldn't be thanking me. They should be thanking those who kind of set it up. So thank you so much, and thank you also, Daniel, for what you did last summer, people don't know, but Daniel automated the whole application process and suddenly it was that that allowed us to be, to welcome 12,000 or so applications and it, without him, it would be impossible. So uh, thank you, Daniel. That was a, a very generous and selfless act of yours. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, everyone. Thank you. And have fun, enjoy it. <laughs> don't do it if you don't enjoy it. If you don't have fun, don't do it. <laughs> exactly. Okay? exactly. All right. Bye -bye. Amazing. Bye. Right, thanks. Thank you so much for everything. You got the fan club here, Daniel. Got the fan club. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. See you tomorrow.